Ba-da. It's Albert of Fist Must Tear. When there was a trouble, he's there on the double. He's tough. <laughs> he's brave. His aim is Albert. Albert. It's Albert of Fist Must Tear. His name is Albert. Albert. It's Albert of his musketeer. Hello! We are now dealing with the French 1920s, 1930s cruiser design doctrine. I'm going to apologize up front for the bad pronunciations which are about to ensue. I do apologize. I have tried my best. I will try and I have tried to learn it as well as I can do. But honestly, and I say this with a lot of love, Mr. Cohen tried for many years. Before that, there was another couple of teachers. And honestly, honestly, the pronunciation and sp spoken was the better part of it. But um, because the written and the other stuff became uh, was decided to be an issue by the school. Mm, I can sort of see where they were coming from. I was having more trouble with that than I was having trouble with other things. And uh, yeah, so haven't done French in a turn of learning environment since I was about 13. Which is... Actually, when it's roughly put in together, roughly a little over 20 years ago. Uh, a little over 20 years ago. So, yeah, I uh, occasionally bumping into French people and practicing my French when they are willing and friendly has not really kept it up. So, hello, Carl McGuswick. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Night6831. Um, thank you for the information about Midway. Um, and 35 Benoists. I'll have this playing at work, but no idea how much I'll be here. Okay, no worries. Hope you enjoy, I hope, I hope work goes well. It is a bit bright from that side, but I have a problem. If I have the curtain clo clo closed and the door across, then I cook. If I have the door open and the curtain across, I merely simmer gently. So I'm going with the simmering and the slightly looking like I'm the phantom of the opera, you know, half mast. Anyway, let's see. Hello, George Newman. Hello, Dan Freeman. Hello, DG40. Hello, Anna Jean Paul. Hello, Pleasure to Vachelle. Hello, Dope Squad. Hello, Jonathan Burrow. Hello, Colin Cameron. And hello, John Sykes. Hello, everyone. Albert of this Christmas this year. Hmm. Anyway. So, tonight's live will be going on till, well, will be about three hours. It has been a space to be about three hours. I have a bottle of Iron Brew. And I have just been reminded that so far today, despite three different attempts, I have failed to actually eat any food. Please note, I am not attempting to starve myself or anything, it's just every time I tend to do, do, do feed food uh, and feed myself, other things came up, which needed attention. So, at 9.30 I will be finishing because I will be ordering food. Now... You may notice some differences. I have done some differences, and I will quickly make these announcements now. I have upped the bandwidth and various other things I have worked on the laptop. So hopefully, hopefully, you get a better image and a better sound quality. Now, some of these I did before I recorded the Long Patrol for this. And some of them, I have to admit, have only been done since. So apologies. The long patrol for this will go out. As far as I know, the sound is coming through clear on all the videos. I haven't changed the sound settings a jot since I got them working, and they seem to be fine. And MS Teams has been not only turned off, MS Teams has been banished to a distant plane at the precise time. So, 
without much further ado. And for hopefully, fingers crossed, with the weekend being free enough to do it, the last time you will see this office organized. So I'm hoping to clear everything out, put down the new floor, build up the shelves, up the walls, and move books all over the place. There'll be books everywhere. It'll be amazing. Dr. Clark needs a steward. Not quite, but um, I certainly need to tra better train the fluffy research assistants. I do need to really train the fluffy research assistants. So, without that, without a further ado, let us consider, and also you will notice that the camera, uh, the, the, the microphone is as close to me as I can get it. As close as I can get it, so hopefully it's picking up. Um, without much further ado, French 1920s and 1930s cruiser design doctrine. And this is a problem for me because this can get to an extent ranty. And it's an issue. And it can get ranty because there are lots of different problems for the French to deal with. And it can sound like you're ranting because you're just listing off the problems. It's one of the interesting things. I kind of liked doing, you know, having doing the American cruisers because there is a good policy through them and you can explain them and you can go, where is this coming from? What is this? Why is this? With the French, you have a very different problem. With the French, you have a very, very specific issue. And I call that the Phantom of the Junicole. Because it just won't die. And this is a warning, really, from history to anyone who thinks that you can... If you take out the leaders, you can kill off an idea and a dream. That thinks that you can reverse things back to what they were, or you can ignore it. You can never ignore it. You have to embrace it, and you have to find a way to work with it. Because there, once an idea has taken hold in a significant portion of your population even if that's taken hold in a significant portion of a minority of your population, in terms of a significant portion of your navy, you are never going to get rid of it completely. It will always be there. And for the French, this is a major issue. Because, without doubt, the Junicol in the 1920s and 30s still holds a tremendous amount of power and a tremendous amount of influence. And by this, I give the example of the Emil Bratin, which is a cruiser and becomes the template cruiser for a lot of subsequent light cruiser and, well, uh, first and second class, cruiser de première class and cruiser de, 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 de première class um, vessels which is actually named for a naval architect associated with the Junicol. It is quite literally named for a naval architect associated with the Junicol. Let's put it this way. Isambard Kingdom Brunel, D.K. Brown, Stanley Goodall, my dad, would never get ships named after them by the Royal Navy unless we are talking a Royal Navy which has millions of ships in a star-spanning empire and are really short of names. I mean, they will have gone through Zebedee first, let alone HMS Corgi or HMS Poodle. There will be, no, there will be literally an HMS Party Poodle, as in P-A-R-T-I-T-I, before there is an HMS, uh, there is an HMS Isambard Kingdom Brunel. There are lots of cruisers built in the interwar years. 
there are seven heavy, uh, seven eight-inch cruiser de premier class, in, and there are eleven um, six-inch cruisers, cruiser de secondary class. Ingenious Iron, can you recommend a novel on the Black Library audiobook app? Nothing focused on Night Lords or Jinsicles. I plan on getting all novels about these two functions. Um, ooh. I have to say, on the audiobooks, I've only listened to one, which was the Russ, uh, the, uh, the Russ one. Um, I don't listen to as many audiobooks as Drac does. Drac is more of an audiobook fan than me. I, I enjoy reading books, even if they're on my Kindle, on the Kindle, on the phone. Um, I am trying to get into audiobooks, especially when I'm driving. But it's getting into it. And at the moment, I'm working for a backlog of Drac NFL Dry Docks, which cover most long distance journeys for me. Hello, Vince Stewart. Uh, hello, Dan Freeman, Jonathan Burrow, and Ingenious Iron, if I might not have said that. Uh, Andrew Paul, a slightly tangent of question. What if the Washington Naval Treaty had allowed armored cruisers to be retained, not replaced, and France has the five armored cruisers, last four uh, classes, in service in the 30s and World War II? Uh, they're highly interesting ships. I don't think they have much of an impact on the outcome of World War II, but they would certainly have an impact on the Italians. Hello, Bob Fry. Hello, Colin Cameron. Um, yes, there are all sorts of things. No, the dock, the trawlers. Yeah, even if there are trawlers, the nicest way the Royal Navy's not naming them after their naval architects. <laughs> um, right. Doctrine-wise, it would be kind of interesting with those armored cruisers, but we'll just start off this. This is what I'm using as a rough framework and explanation for a cruiser. So it's got to fit in these roles somewhere. Endurance. Okay, it's also a rough idea for... It, this is more than just a description of a cruiser. It's a philosophy for using the cruisers. They're economic, and this comes down to here. The cruiser becomes commerce destroyers as well as commerce defenders. The weapon of both the weaker naval power and the stronger. To predominantly land power, cruiser warfare was a useful secondary form of offensive. To a predominantly land power cruiser warfare, it was a useful secondary form of offensive. Interestingly enough, in the Junicole, in every scenario, the cruiser always wins through as being a useful attribute. And you can say that cruiser is, of course, now fulfilling the role of the frigate in the Junicole, because the frigate has become HMS Warrior, has become the battleship. But that's life. The cru a cruiser is there. George Newman, aren't we all working on a backlog of Drax dry, dry docks? Yes. Good evening, David Golden. No, it's a great. They named football clubs, uh, trawlers after football clubs. Yes, football clubs will come before. In a, you know, football clubs rank in with rivers and towns and cities. They're place names they can name things for to inspire people to join them. The Royal Navy will turn to football clubs long before they turn to a naval architects. Long before they turn to anything else. It's disturbing, really. It really is. But, you know, this is the life we, we have. So cruisers are economic assets. They're very useful economic assets and economic warfare assets. But again, let's refer that to, back to the figure I gave at the, sort of somewhere point, I think I've given this when we were discussing the uh, French cruisers in response to one of Night 6831's questions. 11 light cruisers and 7 heavy cruisers are built in the 1930s mostly. The French in the 1920s are mostly going, well, we have our World War One era cruisers and we have our German cruisers. It's lovely. It is wonderful. But it is enough for their needs, but not really enough to give you an idea of what the French philosophy behind cruisers are because they're not building anything. 
but there's still a lot of discussions going on. Colin Stewart, you alone put out more content than I can keep up with. I can't add drag to the, uh, that and be able to write books. Mm, keep writing the books. I enjoy reading them. And yeah, audiobooks be fun as well. I think your audiobooks could do well. Uh, down here in France, couldn't decide if it was land power, maritime power, both neither or what the French. Also from a serious case of French politics in the end four years. We'll be getting into all that. There is all sorts of things we're going to get into with the French politics discussion. Um, George Newman, can you, I'm, a bit, I'm not sure, can you see USS John Erickson? Hmm. The problem for France, and realistically the problem for France, is one of the internal political debate versus the international debate. One of the uh, image versus their reality. France as a nation is, and I've started this off with, this wonderful line which I came up with and was quite proud to start off with. A tale of two cities, two theatres, two strategies, two philosophies. And the two cities, I would argue, are not Paris and Toulon, but they're Brest and Lorient. They are the two cities that build the navy, basically. The two theatres. Their forces are divided constantly between the idea of what they would need for outside the Mediterranean and what they need for inside the Mediterranean. Because any war outside the Mediterranean, whether it's Atlantic or in the Far East, is probably going to be an allied conflict in case what are they bringing? What are they bringing to the table that actually gets them a useful voice? Because, in the nicest way, their allies in any war in the Far East would probably include America and Britain, which will have a humongously larger amount of whatever that is brought to the table than what the French are prepared to pay for. But also there's two philosophies going on. There are two competing philosophies. There is, I would call the balanced navy a philosophy versus the Junikov. And this has really interesting effects and impacts on what the French were able to coherently put forward as a force structure. And at this point is where you have a problem. Because the whole, pro uh, the whole the issue of France is that it needs at least one group, either the navy, the politicians, or the people, to be of singular focus to get things done. If they are all divided and all going about a million different routes and can't make their minds up, nothing will get done. But if any one of those groups is focused, France usually produces amazing things. It's the reality. Um, Mr. It, so you're not expecting an HMS Dr. Alexander Clark? No. Although, you know, I wouldn't say no to a knighthood. If you know, I, I hear there might be an honours list going around. If anyone wants to both knight myself and my good colleague Drak NFL for services to naval history, we wouldn't say no. Um no, sir, the uh, off topic in World War Two the RN had KBV trawlers, but what is that? Uh, those were trawlers re 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 uh, requisitioned during World War II. So, uh, in, to an extent, a lot of the trawlers and the various names that came with them um, were names they already had. So it's not names the Navy gave them, it's names they had. Uh, for example, there's an Earl Kitchener, which is used as a minesweeper. Um, there's no, there's Ibis, but there's no Ingersoll Kingdom Brunel. Uh, 
there's no even king, there's kings and is there a kingdom? Brunel, no, and I don't think there's even a Brunel. Let's go back to the bees and just check the list I've got in front of me. I was sure when I checked earlier. No, there's no Brunel. <laughs> there's a Beau Centaur, a Busavalus, uh, a Brunswick, a British Holland Juris, uh, a Burnhaven, a Burnbanks, a Burke. Fairly sure not that Burke. And a Buckingham and Buchanan's, but there is no Brunel on the trawlers. Um, I'm going to it. Sherberg would argue with it being excluded, but only not because I've been there. Sherberg don't really feature in the construction list of what we're going to be talking about today. Strange enough. Um, Jonathan Morris, so either equivalent capital ships or more cruisers? Mm, it's a debate over what they're going to use. Christopher, I don't know. I know on the army side, the Third Republic had a profound fear of professional army, fearing another Napoleon. To what extent did this paranoia, which often crippled the French army, affect Navy? Uh, we'll be getting into that. There are lots of issues. Lots of issues. I mean, it sounds like you can get a cannon minister uh, post just for not running away right now. Unfortunately, you have to be an MP. Knighthoods are the way to go. After having gone through the knighthood paperwork, I'd rather not do it. Eh. Just think of how great I could be as a knight. And also, just think of the armor Drac would have to commission if he was actually made a knight of his own standing. For starters, he'd get his own personal coat of arms, and he'd have his own armor. And it would be a case of I will wear this in whatever I want to do. And I, you know, in the nicest way, it will be great to follow. Anyway, so this is where I start off with in my discussion of French cruisers. I start off with their industry, okay? We're going to be looking at the shipyards involved in construction. This is where we're going to start off with. The reason I haven't mentioned the shipyards in construction of the ships uh, in the videos, and I won't be in any video on the French, which is rather unusual than any other video, Northampton-class cruisers, all the Italian ones, etc., I talk about the yards. The British ones, I talked about the yards. The German ones, I talk about the yards. In the French ones, I don't talk about the yards. Why? Because honestly, the yards are a subject which are best tackled as a group, and they're going to be tackled in these videos. They're tackled in the Long Patrol, they're tackled in this live. You start off with Ratenu Bretagne Turbine, produced by Auguste Ratenu, who is possibly one of the best French engineers of his generation. Absolutely amazing brain. However, he can design a beautifully proficient turbine. It cannot be built by the French at various points. They have issues with metallurgy, with actually producing to the finite details, etc. Because of the infrastructure behind it, and producing the piping and various other things which feed into it. This is why, more often than not, French cruisers are have as their turbine something from Parsons, which, of course, is the British company. Even when they do have the Rattel Bretagne turbines, components come from other places. And do you know what I find cruel? Here you have a wonderful... French engineer. You have wonderful ideas being forward, really fine stuff. And that's actually being nicked wholesale by these uh, by Parsons because the information to build uh, to help build the stuff has to be given to Parsons for them to help build the stuff and help them with it. Because of the long-term effects of the Junicol. 
And let's put this. Okay, so Juno Coal, what are the long-term effects? Well, of course, you're not building capital ships. You are building some cruisers, but you're not building capital ships. Okay. But you're not really focused on cruiser and cavalry ships, so you don't put enough, you don't put that much industry towards building the size and scale of engines you're talking about. It's not just building ships, it's building the components to go into them. When you're not building the components to go into them in the same volume, you don't have the level of infrastructure investment put in. Which means that in the 1920s and 30s, the French Navy is still dealing with the legacy of the Juno Coal from 60 years ago at this point. Okay? This is what the French are dealing with. They are still being hamstruck. Decisions have an impact. They can have a short, a medium, and a long-term impact, and they always will. There are ways you can mitigate it, but they're not necessarily going to be easy ways to mitigate it. And they're going to take time. So turbines are the heart of a cruiser. Far more than its guns and anything else, tur uh, the turbines are the critical thing. If you want endurance, if you want high speed, all these things come from your turbines. The attributes of a cruiser, if we go back here, indicates her principal task, which has always been long-range patrolling, and from this requirement flows her chief attribute of endurance. A cruiser must also be large enough to keep the sea and any river under line, fast enough to be the eyes of the fleet, to scout, to shadow, to overhaul the enemy in a chase. So literally, the critical point here is endurance, the next critical point is speed, which means you need turbines. Your turbines are critical to your attributes. They come before firepower. They come before everything. This one has large enough to keep the sea in any weather and then speed. Up here, it's endurance. It's 0.4 before you get powerful enough to overwhelm that enemy with her guns. That's a long way down the list. And all of this comes from the engines. And this is another trouble for France when it comes to construction, because they very much want to build at home. They very much, that's one thing that their yards and their politicians, everyone can agree with, they want to build it French. They want to build it French. And they almost wait to try to build it French. In fact, some of the delays you get in these ships are they start off building and designing for French and then. It gets to a certain point and they basically phone up Parsons and go, we need an order. And Parsons are nice. They don't gloat. They just go, we will fit you into our next slot and we will get you the air turbine. And it is, it, it's not something the French want to do. But they have to because they haven't got the production facilities to deliver the quality or the quantity of turbines which are asking for, which are not a large number. but they're not enough. <laughs> the French army seem to be a walking collection of dysfunctionalities. We'll get to that. Um, Dan, uh, Dan Freeman. Uh, he, uh, Darius Rowski. He'd commission the armour and wear it to the knighting ceremony. Yes, he would. That room, College et al. list H of three times HMS Brune for an HMS Brunei, three Brunswick's, but above Brun you have Bruiser, and below Brun Star you have Bre. Yeah, no Brunel. Same reference. There was an HMS Clark here for a flower class corvette built by Harlan the Wolf. I will have to find her and commission a painting. I was trying to see tube allies, anyone? Yep. He is an absolutely. There are points at which there is a story about him going taking apart a turbine which has been very supplied and being very upset with some of the tubes. 
And yet, again, that wasn't through want of trying. They were trying to deliver on time with the best quality they could have, but we all know how precise the tube alloys have to be. That's a, that's a factor of the alloys if you're going to do high-pressure steaming, especially for long periods. And the French have the capability to produce them. They do. Some of the ships do go to sea with uh, Ratu Bretang turbines. And they perform well. But also quite a significant number, almost the majority of them, go to sea with Parsons. For the same reason. Because there are issues in the supply chain of them. Take care, Glenn. Good luck. So technical problems from the 19th century still. Technical legacy from the 19th century. Actually, it's not something the French want to do, but with the yards going out of business in the interwar period, did the French orders help Parsons stay afloat <laughs> till rearmament when they are needed? Uh, honestly, Parsons... It, this is going to sound... Both Parsons and Brown get enough orders from the British Navy. One of the things you have to remember about the Royal Navy, and this is something, again, the Royal Navy does spend money on, and you can understand it. It does help when they get the foreign orders, but also British ships have new turbines fitted disturbingly regularly. It's almost every major refit. New engines. 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 New engines, new turbines, new turbines. And that is literally to keep going the infrastructure, to keep the infrastructure going. That is something the British, the Royal Navy is allocating funds to invest in. Because they know long lead items like turbines and armour are going to be the hardest hit. The trouble is you can't give a ship new armour every time it comes into port and refit. So you can't keep armour going like you can turbines. You can't just fire it. It's inert and too expensive, and the politicians will see through it. But turbines, you can claim wear down. And wear out a lot quicker than they actually do. And that is something they do do. So... Meet Arsenal de Lorient. Now, the Lorient Arsenal, uh, Lorient Arsenal. This is one of the more interesting ones to look at, in my mind. Um, if I just get my notes up. Now, I will admit, I am using a Google Translate to translate a page that I am reading from a website as the basis of the notes which have come from this. Because I use that as the base point and then I, now I've built my own notes based on that. But I will admit that I did start off with a very interesting short history of Lorient, of Arsenal de Lorient, written by Lucien Le Palec, uh in the Université de Temps uh, Libre. Which is all beautifully written in excellent academic French and is very much worth a read if you can speak French. If you can't speak French, you have to take it to a thing called Google Translate and have it translate the entire PDF. Anyway, leaving that to one side, there are a lot of very interesting ships built at this arsenal. A lot of them. Including, of course, a lot of modern ships, a lot of Versas, Avisos, which are basically the French equivalent of a sloop. Not quite a sloop specialist, but they do build a lot of them. And a lot of sort of French cruisers, um, including the Corbet in 1911. That's a battleship, isn't it? Yeah, battleship. Corbett was Carras. I keep having fun with Carras, but they'll uh, they'll have most fun 
and I do say most fun, building pretty much everything the French need at various points. They're an interesting yard in that their history begins in 1666 when they are founded by the French East India Company. They're first founded pretty much as a harbour facility. They are to support their operations rather like the British East India Company basically builds the Port of London and various other facilities up. Uh, there are arguments about Southampton. In 1688, the yards are uh, rec uh, requisitioned by the Royal Navy of France uh, for the War of the League of Augsburg. The St the East India Company still keeps building stuff there. They, of course, built a rope factory in 1676. And they build general stores intended for the uh, armaments and disarmament of ships. But in 1755, the arsenal began to develop east of Scorp and opened freeholds at Lannister. Um, in 1793, a fire destroyed some of the buildings and the sail loft, as well as most annoyingly for historian archives and armament officers. And... Well... A lot of what we see today was actually built after World War II, because it was rebuilt in 1956, um, because of the American bombardments and probably some British bombardments in 1943, etc. It's a good, it's an interesting yard. Contrast, uh, French East India Company. Lorient, L'Orient, suddenly makes sense as a name. Yep. Actress Van Dunn. It's not something France wanted to do with the yards going on, but this is one of all the periods. Yeah, did it, did it. Actress Van Dunn. Part of it was because I noticed the Brits can do, can and do go big on cruisers, carriers, and destroyers when rebuilding, but as you say, there are armor issues slowing down battleships. Along with 16 inches for the Lions, they'd really like to get built quicker. Uh, to be honest, the problem with the 16 inches for the Lions was because instead of going for 16 inch guns or 15 inch guns, which would have been far more sensible for King George V, um, Chatfield is obsessed with the 14 inch guns. Obsessed to the extent that he accepts all sorts of things to, allow, uh, to basically allow him to get the 14 inch guns through with the support of the rest of the Admirals. Then there is the Arsenal de Brest. Now, this is an older one. This is, if it's anything to sort of help it, this is the. How do I put this politely? Okay, so, all right, there is a great website called Naval Technology, which again was the starting point for a lot of research into this, apart from the books. And I used that to feed off into various sources. And. The Naval Technology have this great article, which I think is, is, is I'm not sure if it's written in English or French. I, I, the version I'm reading is in English, but I have a feeling from its syntax and flow it was written originally in French. Um, the port was originally for Brest, is constructed between 1631 and 35. There are powder magazines, Cordelier and Military Hospital, operational by 1674. Trulan Dock is built in 1683. The Pontu Docks and other structures finished by 1746. Constructions of, of the warships began um, in the late sort of 1850s. There were Dupuy de Lhomme in 1895, the battleships Charles Martel in 1897, Charlemagne in 1899, Aena in 1902, Republic in 1906, and Democrati in 1908, uh, Leon Gambetta in 1905, Edgar Quinette in 1911. They'd also, of course, build Clemenceau in 1961 there. But more importantly, this is the base where the French start off and is really, I would argue, is 
sucker of the Jeunacol because it gets its construction start really in 1850 um, of modern warships with torpedo boats, uh, to uh, torpedo boats. Um, the Penfield port is a classic example. That was closed for commercial boats and transformed into a military port in 1865. And Brest built more than 150 warships in the 1900s. That's the, uh, no, not 1900s, 1700s, 18th century. And they are slowly sort of, it, it has peaks and troughs of construction. It's a really good yard for the French, though. And the fact it's involved in cruiser construction is key. But one of the points I'm going to make is the French build 18 cruisers in between World War I and World War II in their nation. They spread the construction over five yards, most of them building just one cruiser. The vast majority are built between Brest and Lorient. And you sort of go, well, why didn't you? T you'd almost look at the French and go, why didn't you? T uh, why didn't these sh yards become your cruiser specialists? There are reasons for producing cruisers elsewhere, but you're not really producing that many, and you could have made it more, possibly made it more efficient. It's a question. It's certainly a debate that a lot of French construction is very political, in terms of where it's awarded. And this is where you get into problems, as I'll be explaining, in the political systems with France in this period. Don't know, 18, was that a lot compared to other places? Not really. Um... We've got, for the Royal Navy, the entire county class, our refusers... Um, let's be honest, they finish off the D's and the E's post-World War I. Um, died, uh, got Dido's between World War II, you got Towns, you have not any Crown Conleys, but you do have the Leanders and the Amphians. Um, you have or, you know, you have a lot of cruisers built by the British, and the Americans built a lot of cruisers, and the Italians build more uh, build cruisers as well. What's interesting is it's it's not a small amount, but it's also not a it's not a lot, but it's rather a large amount to be spread over so many yards. In terms of its time, and not again, you've got the context of the French Empire. All right. You also have the Society Nouvelle de Forges et Chantiers de la Méditerranée, which is interesting because they build the burn. Unsurprisingly, they don't get the orders for future carriers for the French. It's, you know, when World War II happens, there is a different yard which has on its order books um, building another battleship and two carriers. And you sit there and go, yes, and you were not the yard which built the burn. No, I can't think why you're being not being used. Uh, the burn, that yard's not being used. And they, for some reason, get ordered one cruiser in this period, the Macomb. And it's a La Gossonier class, which are lovely cruisers. They are lovely cruisers. Uh, nine six inch guns. Uh, following the ML Britain layout, they have style, they have grace, they have presence. They are they are lovely light cruisers. Uh, honestly, you sit there and look at them and go, "Hmm, you good." But you also sit there and look at them and go, "Hmm, France, why are you not churning out more of these?" Uh, please don't say that word. Feels internal pain. 
Hold on. That come? Done. <laughs> Let go see any class. <laughs> I know. The, 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 the point I'm trying to make is... Hello, JC. Um, the France has a lot of good yards. This is the yard, the Ateliers et Chantiers de Loire, uh, which is a really good place for building their bigger capital ships. And yet they build a single cruiser. And you sit there and go, considering all the other things you need at the time and considering you only have one aircraft carrier would it have been more sensible to have built an aircraft carrier in your big yard rather than build a cruiser and build that cruiser in another yard I'm, I'm just, just saying it would have perhaps been more sensible but you know life happens It really does. And this is a very good yacht. This is the point I'm trying seriously to make. The French have lots of good components, but they can't make them sing together. I do not know. There are many reasons why, and we're probably getting into the reason why. I do not know why, and no point, someone doesn't really work this one out. But the French have lots of good components. Which is why I try and be very careful when I'm talking about the French. It's kind of like when I'm talking about Northampton class, and I made the I kept, I kept making the point. Um, this has caused some interesting reactions from people. If I evaluate them as heavy cruisers, then they're in trouble. If I evaluate them as scout cruisers, then they are absolutely good ships. With the French, if I put them in a comparison to anyone else, they start to suffer because of the inefficiencies in their systems and the way they have been must messed around because of the Juno Coal and the infrastructure issues. But if I look at them in, the, in, in their individual components, they're good. They're hardworking. They produce good quality ships. It just takes them an awful long time to do it. That's right. Is it the same yard that built the DD sort of Polish Navy, the Vicar class? Uh, potentially. <laughs> good ideas, bad execution. Um, good ideas, good workers, somehow they do not marry the two up. And here is the Forges at Chantiers de la Guillaume, which is. A yard which pretty much specializes in producing these aviosos, which are the French equivalent of sloops. And they're lovely little ships. Lovely little ships. Present ships from around the world. And then they go, yeah, we want you to build a cruiser. The Gloire. Why? Why would you suddenly... You know, you've got a yard which is happily churning out these small ships. There are some good reasons. You could say it's to maintain the infrastructure, it's to give them the honour of building a cruiser, it's to mass-produce your cruisers. But if you're going to do that, if you're going to use this yard to build cruisers occasionally, why are you building a cruiser in this yard, which is getting plenty of orders from capital ships and supposedly carriers? You could have used that yard to build a carrier on another capital ship earlier, because honestly, it isn't that quick. You know, it is not that quick to build a Lagassiana class. Um, it just... It, it should be. It should be quick. But it's not. I have nothing more to say on that, uh, uh, sort of, uh, other than that, on those ones, because you know it, it, it should be quick. It should be quick to build these ships, but it isn't. And what I find most interesting about the particular ship they build here is, of course, they build. The Marseille. And they build it between 1933. It's laid down in 1933, launched in 1935, commissioned in 1937. It's 
Okay, yes, it's October 1933, but it's October 1937 when it's commissioned. So it takes four years from being laid down to being commissioned. And this is a yard which they could instead have been using to build... Well, they build Jean Bart, the Riccolo class, built in conjunction with C. Penal. They build the Strasbourg in 1936. Uh... They have orders for aircraft carriers, orders for, you know, there are so many things. But when you consider the Strasbourg and the Jean Bart, well, let's consider the Strasbourg. Laid down 19, November 1934, launched December 1936, commissioned September 1938. So roughly four years of work goes into it. The Jean Bart. Technically laid down 1936, launched 1940, and commissioned 1949. Uh, we won't get into that one too much, but that's the picture at the top there. So, is there a go? they spent four years on a cruiser, they spent four years on a destroyer. Which would I prefer this yard building? Another cruiser or another destroyer? Another cruiser? They, they spent four years on a cruiser, they spent four years on a battleship. Which would I prefer them building? Another battleship? An aircraft carrier? They could have built that. Could have had a better carrier in the service than Ben. And let's be honest, an aircraft carrier would have fit the school the Juno Coal. I'll get into that later. But no, no, they are they're building a cruiser. Which could have been built in other yards. So, who are making the decisions? Well, in theory, it's this lot, but it's in theory. H of not the Gloire. Never call it the Gloire. Hmm? Grand. But the G is pronounced like fromage, like in fromage. Fromage? Gironde? Gironde? Hmm. Okay, thank you. So, the Admirals. We have an interesting rogues gallery of French chiefs and naval staff here. And that is always a start for these discussions. Now, I'm going to... Of course, you have Delan over there, who is uh, <clears throat> the furthest I can get him away from me. But you have, starting off on this side, if I can make sure I can find his correct name, so I call him the correct thing, Pierre Alexis Ronac. Now, he's in charge from the 16th of April 1919 to the 4th of February 1920. 294 days. <laughs> 294 days. And... He theoretically has, in that time, two ministers and only one commander in chief. Which is quite nice, because most of them will go through a lot more than that. After him will come Henry Saloon, who is the gentleman under the Lan. He will visit twice as chief of naval staff. And in his first visit, which will be 357 days long, he has, again, two ministers. But he has, and I kid you not, three. Three. Commander-in-Chiefs. Raymond Poincaire, Paul de Chanel, and Alexander Millerand. Then comes the gentleman in the centre. Maurice Gasset, I, who I like. I like him. He's a nice guy. But he will be in as Vice Admiral and be in charge of the Navy for three years, 179 days. He has, I think it's six ministers? Hang on, no. Five ministers. And he will serve under two commanders-in-chief in that three years and 179 days. So 
he has a changeover of ministers more often than you want to think about, really. And then Salun comes back, still a vice admiral. He's come back three years later, and he'll be in post for three years, 172 days. He'll have only uh, Gaston de Murg as his uh, commander in chief, so he has one president. But in his time, he will go through. Let's see. Uh, oh, good lord. Oh, good lord. He's back again. Oh, and. He's back again. Okay, so now, yeah, three, five ministers again over three years, 172 days. Then, Louis Hippelt Villet, who is obsessed with submarines and the guy who came up with the periscope, uh, he's in power under, again, Gaston de Merg uh, the whole time for three years and 37 days. But uh, in his time, he will have a mere five ministers. He's starting to get the point. Um, then you have Georges Duranviel, who is very good. He's in post for five years, 318 days, and honestly, we can't count how many ministers he goes through. He also goes through three heads of state. Gaston de Merg, Paul de Merg, and Albert Leon. And then, of course, de uh, François Dolan comes in power. Now, he is under the previous system. This is the French Republic rather than the French state. He is in post for two years and 176 days. Under the command of Albert Lebron as the commander-in-chief. And in that period, he has four ministers. Now, here is a little point. The gentleman here, I love him dearly, but I think in one week alone, he possibly walked into an office on Monday and said, hello, secretary, Monsieur Secretary. And the secretary turned and said, ah, oh, Admiral, it is good to see you. We'll have a long and fruitful relationship to each other. Please call me by da 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 and then on Wednesday, he turned up for another meeting and went, Hello, Secretary. And the Secretary responded with, Oh, Admiral, it's good to meet you. I will have a long and fruitful relationship. Please call me da 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 this. And then on Friday, he turned up again and went, Hello, Secretary, it is good to meet you. And uh, the Secretary turned around and goes, Ah, oh, Admiral, it is good to meet you. Please call me this. Why? Because every single one is a different person. They are good officers, but they are also sitting a, a powder keg. They have a combination of people who are focusing on Japan, the people who are focusing on Italy, and the people who are focusing on this idea. And this is the different idea. So, the treaties have come, the naval treaties. And now we no longer have to deal with the threat of capital ship construction. This means that once more, and for finally, the age of the Junacol has come. The Junacol is here. Fantastic! The Junacol is here. And some of them, some of their admirals, inc managed to encapsulate all three ideas in their heads simultaneously. I mean, literally simultaneously. And some of them actually achieve admiral rank. Others favour one group over the other. Some are sitting there going, but haven't we killed the Junicole? Surely it's balanced fleet time. Please. Please. They're all various ones trying their best and having to deal with it. And it doesn't help when you've got what you've got going on above you. And it doesn't help when you've got all the trouble you've got going on in terms of infrastructure terms. So these admirals, what I, with notable exceptions, I will say they are very hardworking. They are very committed. They are trying their best. 
they do not necessarily have the best luck, and they are not necessarily given the best hand to deal with in the first place. I say, what killed off the surviving French armor cruisers and protected cruisers? Treaties. No, um, Verdun. I would just like to point out that compared to uh, compared to the French nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties government, the British governments currently look rather sane, stable, and contiguous. Do not. Uh, it, 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 this is going to sound terrible, but do not. And also, I will stand up for Ben Wallace. Uh, there are certain MPs in our, uh, 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 who I will stand up for, and both Ben Wallace and Penny Morden have really impressed me with some of the stuff they said on defence lately. Which is, I know modern stuff, but you know, um, the fact is, I don't think any defence secretary would have turned on oh, this of the French period, or even up till recently, would have turned around to the House of Commons Select Committee and gone. Well, the trouble is, we've all been killing. We've all been selling off the sexy, uh, the non-sexy stuff, and developing them under to save money. We've been every single government of ours and our previous one have been cutting off and undermining the non-sexy stuff. So we've been taking down our stocks of weapons. We've been dealing, uh, undermining our infrastructure. We've been getting cutting training, cutting everything, so we can fo uh, still retain the sexy stuff, which gets the attention. But you know. And I think all these animals were dealing with that back then. You know, it's nothing new. Governments often try and save money by cutting the stuff which isn't going to get the attention. Now, so... The presidents of France, and before we get into these particular French presidents. I'd like to point out something. Between 19, November 19, 1918 and September 1939, there were, and I will show you the extent of my working out. I produced a chart, handwritten chart, so I could keep it, work it out. There were approximately 30 cabinets with 19 individuals serving as prime ministers for an average cabinet length of eight months and 10 days. On average, each minister seems to have, each, each prime minister seems to have changed naval secretaries somewhere in the region of twice. Somewhere in the region of twice on average, so that gives you an idea, and that's average. So some are changed more often than others. I would also add that's a very rough average, and me doing a lot of maths and people factors. Some people theoretically retain the title of naval secretary, but seem to move into other departments while still having all that department, and then so someone else is actually de facto taking it over and running it, and that just it just adds to confusion, and then there's. It's because of the factional level of governments. But anyway, so these gentlemen are your presidents in roughly that time period. Roughly that time period. These are the presidents you're talking about. They are Alexander Millerand, who is president from September 1920 till June 1924. He's pre preceded by Paul Deschel. Um, then there is Gaston Dumergue, who is Dumergue, who is D O U E M E R G U E, this gentleman, who serves the post for seven years and is a radical socialist and radical Republican Party member. Um, he's one of the interesting people of the French government. Uh, then there's Paul Dumer, who is in power for 329 days before he's shot by uh, a Paul Gouf. 
So he doesn't really have much power, much influence. And it's Albert Lebrun, who is a Democratic Alliance. And he's in power for eight years and 32 days. So it's one of the interesting things that on the top, the French look stable. They look like, you know, oh, well, he's in power for three years. He's in 262 days. So that's quite a while. Then he's in power for seven years. He's in power for a year, then shot. But, you know, this is this is happens it happens in every period occasionally and then he's in power for eight years so honestly two and four they run the 1920s and 1930s the trouble is do they really run it the president is theoretically very powerful but it's a case of they're supposed to reign and run foreign policy but the Prime Minister is supposed to lead domestic policy and their cabinet. And domestic, and of course the military is split between the two. And if you have the average cabinet length being 8 months and 10 days for this period, roughly, again, roughly, this is me doing mental math, so please excuse me on this one. And it's the presidential sash they're all wearing, I think which is why it looks so similar. Um, you are not going to get much in terms of consistent policy going on. When the president stopped wearing moustaches, I do not know. I think it's a shame. They, it was quite cool. Jonathan Burrow, U.S. forces on Okinawa went through key, three commanding generals in less than a week, but they were in combat on time. That would explain a lot. I have a more complex chart for looking at several key French counter positions when trying to think through a what if. It hurt my brain a lot. Yeah. Um, I have got more complex charts, but trying to work them all out because of the moves is an interesting time. It wasn't the cabinet member who got shot. It was the president. This one got shot. 329 days in office. It's also something to note that, you know, sashes matter. So France has a lot of interesting politics going on. You also have that added on that whilst all four of these officers, can, uh, these presidents can be united in the view that they do not want to fund the military, they do not want another war, they are doing everything from sticking their hands in their ears to literally trying to stick their heads in sand to avoid the idea that there will be any future conflict. They also combine this with an absolutely massive massive attention to detail in obsessing over the Germans and trying to be punitive towards the Germans. Um, Paul Demer is interesting because he actually displaces the pacifist Arieste de, de, Bra uh, de Briand who is at several points I think from memory uh, Prime Minister of France, yes. Uh, and he is an avowed pacifist. In fact, he's Prime Minister of France on five occasions. No, oh, six. Six occasions he is Prime Minister. Ariste Estrebriand. Um, these are all the, they're all the end of legacy of World War I in their own way. And they don't want to fight a war again. But, they're also in charge of the strategic decisions which France takes. And there is a big problem going on there, because they are at the same, po at the same point as they are honestly one of the... 
there is a point made that you know uh one of these gentlemen is gust on the move this gentleman uh He's the first Protestant president of France, and he's famed for taking a very firm stance against Germany and his resurgent nationalism. Well, that's good. That's lovely. You're taking a firm stance against resurgent nationalism. You actually have probably pushed that. And if you consider you started off in 1924 when it's Vichy France, uh, when it's not Vichy France, when it's um, not Vichy, when it's <sighs> Weimar Republic, sorry, brain dying. You, you, you're dealing with problems. You know, the Weimar Republic is one of those organizations which you actually probably want to try and keep going, and you keep being punitive towards them. Even the names they adopt for their German ships, the German cruisers, they're all named for towns in Alsace-Lorraine. Places in Alsace-Lorraine. That's what they name... Uh, Again, this is from memory and having checked the geography, so I, I'm not going to be... I haven't done massive digging on it um, as a specialism, but they all clucked up as places in that region. I was going, yeah, that's kind of rubbing salt and wounds. I can understand why you're doing it after World War One, but there's also a case of maybe a little bit of subtlety might have been worthwhile. Take care, John Farrell. Definitely. I keep hitting uh, hitting S on the keyboard when I want to, uh, I want something else. I'm tired of my keyboard is stupid. Ah, oh, don't worry. We all have that. Uh, Jesse, presidents stopped wearing sashes the day beauty pageants adopted them. No, I think beauty pageants had them for a long before pre time before presidents did uh, didn't got rid of them. I think it, it's something to do with the uh, television. Thunderin Briand, like a, a steak, Chateau Briand. Uh, you should at least get that one right. I did get Brian right. Anyway, so here is France and the Mediterranean, and basically what I've taken is I've taken the the map of the French. Was it an empire and I've divided it up to discuss it. So, what's their issue in the Mediterranean? In the air issue in the Mediterranean is entirely Italy, which from 1922 onwards is a fascist dictatorship with a leader, Il Duce, who is obsessed with building big, fast battleships, big, fast cruisers, and wearing natty clothes. Because let's be honest, What's the point of being a fascist the Italian dictator if you can't have different clothes for every day of the week? And probably every day of the year. And yes, I am being a little bit sarcastic, uh, but I do not want to, you know, minimize his response, etc. But I do wish to make a poke a little fun at him. Now... The Mediterranean is the one theatre where France conceivably could end up fighting a war alone. If there was a war between them and Italy, probably over those islands or North Africa. Conceivably end up fighting a war alone. However, even the French acknowledge that in that such a scenario, the likelihood of the Italians going east and attacking the protectorate in Syria is probably not that high because the British also have their mandates in the Middle East, Iraq, Palestine, and the British have bases at Malta and Alexandria, and the British would not like any issues being caused in their protect in their mandates, so they'll probably discourage the Italians from going that way. There's also very little likelihood of the Italians managing to fight their way through the entirety of the Western Mediterranean, and going past Gibraltar without, again, the British going, N -n -n -n, back you go. No extension of the war theatre beyond here. So any war against Italy, barring maybe submarines which might get through Gibraltar and might get into the, uh, into the Atlantic, is probably going to be concentrated into the Western theatre of the Mediterranean, the Western Basin. 
which if their one side of Corsica Sardinia is going to have a lot of them a lot of French air support if they're the other side of Corsica and Sardinia then they are going to be surrounded by Italian bombers it's literally that finite so what are they going to do well again Algeria unlike Ita unlike Italian North Africa Libya etc is fairly self-sufficient. They can, using Morocco, etc., get supplies, theoretically, theoretically, from the Atlantic coast of France to Morocco and to Algeria and Tunisia. They can, theoretically, therefore, supply that way. They might need to run urgent supply convoys across and back, but those would be rare. What are they mostly going to do? Well, they're mostly going to be attacking Italian trade, which is going to be their light cruisers and their destroyers taking a lead, attacking and interceding in terms of Italian economic capabilities. And they are mostly going to be concentrating their capital ships and their heavy cruisers into a fighting fleet, which are going to fight the Italian, their Italian equivalent. Uh, they're expecting the battle to take so somewhere, probably Corsica, Sardinia area. Broadly speaking, from what I'm reading, that's what I'm putting together. And this was an, an idea of what the British would do in a war ver between France versus Italy. Okay, it's France. Versus... The British wouldn't probably get involved in a French versus Italian fight. Their idea would be they could pretty much duke it out together, which is another reason why. Please note, every time someone turns around to me and goes, "But the Dunkirks, they're battle cruisers because they're built to hunt down the Deutschen class." Okay, so the Germans become a threat with the Deutschen class in the night in the nineteen thirties. The Italians have been a threat from 1922. The Italians have a lot of capital ships. The French know this, and the French are building capital ships as well. The reason the both sides have capital ships, the idea is to, f to fight each other. The f Italians have more capital ships at any time than the Germans do. So when you're building a capital ship for the French, you are not focusing on the Deutschland class. Because, as I'll be getting to in any sort of wider war that involves the Atlantic, etc., you can expect the Royal Navy to be far more of a part of it and more likely to get involved. But in a war versus the Italians, it's the only scenario where they could end up fighting solo, realistically, and then you're going to need capital ships to fight other capital ships. There are photos of the Gaulle, Emmanuel Macron, uh, and Emmanuel Macron with the presidential sash and badge and official portraits and state like a state donor. It's still in use in France and many other nations. Yeah. It just doesn't get worn as often. Do, uh, uh, to be honest, those gentlemen wore it quite a lot more. What was in here? It flew out, but something flew in. Hmm. The Francisco Caracol class were, of course, not built at this point. They hadn't been built, and that was the legacy of the treaties. So that's not a problem for the Italian, for the French to worry about. The French at this point are just worried about the Italian rebuilds, the Italian new builds, and what exactly they're going to be fighting in the Western Mediterranean. You also all have to remember something else. If the French get really beaten up in any Mediterranean conflict, it's not really going to help the British out. So benevolent neutral is the minimum you'd expect the British to be. If the French really started to lose, then the British would either come in and force peace, which is probably what they do, 
by just go, doing something like they were doing in terms of the patrols um, during the Civil War, etc., and basically going, you will not be fighting at sea. Probably slightly more <clears throat> efficient than they did versus the Spain, a Spain, because they can actually better support those. Or would side with the French. Because for the British, the French being wiped out at sea is problematic. Why? Because, of course, for the French, uh, the British wider strategic concern, part of their sums for Kia for being able to go and face off against the Japanese whilst also deter conflict with the Italians and later in the 1930s, the Germans at home, is based on having the French fleet as extra ships. That's the reality. The British are basically planning on using the French ships mostly to shore up the home front. Hmm. So, the French Empire, 1919 to 1939. As you can see, the vast majority of it is Africa or the Pacific Ocean. There is also a bit called Madagascar. There is some of South America. And there is a large area of Southeast Asia, which Mondays tend to be referred to as sections of Vietnam, uh, Laos, and I think Cambodia. Sections of. There are also some Caribbean islands. Now... Here's the reality for the French in the Far East. Are they building to defend their empire from Britain and America, the largest navies in the world? Nope, because they have no chance of doing that, because both those nations have, even the Americans, who have theoretically the equivalent of the British, but of course don't get the funding to be the equal of the British, and the British, who have the funding, but don't really have... Uh, probably, were, if they wanted to do it, could do it, could take the French Empire off the French, and wouldn't break much of a sweat over it in naval terms. Yes, actually landing troops and taking those territories, they probably don't want to do. But, navally, they're not going to worry about it. How about the Japanese in the Far East? Well, the Japanese, remember, are the world's only second rank naval power. The French and Italians are joint third. The British and Americans being joint first under the treaty system. The Japanese have way more military combat capability than the French do, and it's a lot closer to the French Far Eastern Empire than the French industrial centre is. They can't win that either. But they don't need to. Why don't they need to? Because if Japan attacks France, if Japan attacks France, then there'll be a race between Britain and America to see who can declare war in defense of their French democratic ally first. Why? Because of a dirty little secret. If the Japanese attack the French, then probably you're going to get the League of Nations European powers, i.e. Italy, probably wanting to join in alongside them for uh, grandizing reasons, because that's what Mussolini's like. If the British don't get involved and the Americans do, then in the post-war settlements, the Americans will get control of the Far East, which will undermine the British position. If the British get involved and the Americans don't, it will undermine the American position. And everyone, of course, will presume that those alliances would win. And they probably would, let's be honest, because they have a lot more infrastructure, industry. It wouldn't be a quick and easy fight. I, I am not one of those people who believes the Japanese would have fallen over easily in the 1920s and early 1930s. There is no point the Japanese would fall over easily. But it's a case of they would probably win because they have the infrastructure and other things to do it. So the French know that they would be part of an allied force. And probably it would include both the Americans and British. Now, interestingly enough, whose fleet would the, uh, the French add on their ships to? The Americans will, of course, go across the Pacific because this makes sense because there's their industrial base and they move that way. It makes sense. Yay! 
Where does the French fleet go? Well, the French fleet, I would argue, would probably join the British fleet. Why? Because the British fleet will go out from the Atlantic, collect in the Mediterranean, go through the Indian Ocean, go up the supports, and leapfrog up through Singapore, probably French Indochina, probably into various parts of China, and then to Japan. Why do they go that way? Because they have bases and support and infrastructure going that way. They have no base and support to go across the Atlantic, then through the Panama Canal, then across the Pacific. One route makes sense for the Americans because of where their infrastructure is. The other route makes sense for the European powers because of where their infrastructure is. It's going to lead to a different scale of ships and different design philosophies and ideas on how to fight a war in the Pacific, but that makes sense. The fleets would probably all combine somewhere off, well, considering the Americans would come to the Philippines, it would come across the Philippines, then work their way up. You probably have them combining off Formosa, modern, uh, Formosa, Taiwan. Then. <sighs> I'm hoping everything's still working. I haven't watched the live streaming bit in a second, so. Oh. Now would be a good time to insert an ad, apparently, according to YouTube. Uh, no, I'm not going to insert an ad. But um, that's nice to know. They're all, it's always flashing up and telling me I need to insert ads and advertise super chats and all these things. Hello. Have you arrived? You've come to say hello, have you? You heard we're discussing the French and the Far East, and you decided to come and say hello. Okay. You heard your brother was in the long patrol. No, oh, you're not. You're go Oh, you. Of course. Sorry. He has his requirements for before he takes part in these things. Nope. Oh. There you go. Hello. You good? You behave yourself? Broadly speaking. Keep up. Just in certain hand if you go I have to go to the loo. Yeah, I'm tempting. Just shill a book or something. Ah, uh, I'm working on the books. I'm working on the books. I want to get a lot of writing done. Uh, honestly, if I had the and this will sound terrible, but it's it's the reality of life. When you're home with your family, I love them dearly, and they do bend over backwards to help me with my work and stuff, not to disturb. But there's always something going on because you're working from home. And always something going on. You know, the other day my sister managed to back give herself a black eye. Don't get me started. Uh, literally, I, I, I was just working, and then suddenly a third opened. Ow! I went, how have you done that? I walked into a door. I went, please don't tell anyone that, because I'm the only bloke living here. And Raleigh, you know, they're going to think it was either me or the poodle that gave you this, not, you know, you being silly and walking into a door. And she went, yeah, but, you know, it happens. So, yeah, I keep considering trying to, if I had the money, I'd probably be booking a writing retreat at the moment for a weekend away, somewhere quiet, to just sit and write and ignore everything. Oh... <sighs> I used to do that in archives, etc., but now you can't go and loiter with intent in archives. They don't give you enough time to do that. Dog eyed, yes. Thank you, uh, uh, Verdun. Insert an ad. <laughs> he is the national dog of France. No. No one could w would watch the ads if you weren't forced to watch them. Aggressive negative business practice. Treating the customer like an enemy to be conquered rather than a friend to be cultivated. Mm, yeah. Always should blame the dog. Anyway, so the Far East. It's for France, it's entirely a thing of what can we offer? Because they know there is not much they can bring to the table in comparison to those big two, especially if the fact that it's the same equation as the Dutch have. Remember, the Dutch are looking at offering and building battle cruisers. Why are the Dutch building battle cruisers? To defend their things against the French, uh, Japanese? To make them a risk? Yes, and yes. But most importantly, what the fast ships offer the. Uh, offer the the Allies. They offer them more fast capital ships. Basically, any French, any Dutch ships, any Italian ships which joined in this force 
would be additional ships to what the Americans and British would bring. Dan Freeman, is your sister giving a safe lecture to the engineers of black eyes now? Yes. She's okay. But, yeah, she is. There it is. Yeah. She actually went in and gave a tour with a black eye, and I went, do you want me to go and give the tour rather than you? Went, no, no, no. I know the engineering. I, I know all the things. You've got a black eye. You've literally got purple. You look like you have you you uh, were in that mood that video um where they go walk like an egyptian or dance like an egyptian that sort of video and, you know you've seen the makeup they look she looks like you've got one eye like that i'm going really really anyway and so just pitch in with draken by a surplus tugboat or trawler and convert it to a holiday writing retreat tempting don't think we'll have to discuss that at some point, but uh, yeah, I think that might require more funds than I currently have available because I am, how do I put this, product rich, income poor at the moment, in that I've done a lot of work for things and I haven't yet got, the pay hasn't yet started rolling in from. So I've put out a lot of money to do the research and do the work, but the, the income hasn't yet started coming. So France has to fight in two places at once. Everyone has to fight in two places at once. The Atlantic. It's rather a similar occasion. Again, I refer you to the whole things about the Deutschland class. Usually the comments about them and the French capital ships being able to hunt them down or designed to hunt them down and kill them comes up in the late 1930s when they are trying to deter a conflict against Germany. Again, when they're looking at the Atlantic, what can they offer the British? Because if you're fighting a war in the Atlantic, the only real power you're going to be fighting against is Germany. And the odds of Britain letting France go to war against Germany one-on-one -on -one is very unlikely. And again, militarily-wise, who has a larger navy? The French or the Germans? It's the French. The French have a more powerful navy than the Germans. They have certainly have more capital ships in commission in 1939-1940. They have more carriers in commission. And they really do. So, yeah, it's interesting, to say the least. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Verdun. Uh, so the Deutschen class, what are they going to do? What are they doing about the Panzer Chief? Well, they do have these capital ships. They do have these heavy cruisers. And they will be part of the surface, uh, the surface raider hunter groups, the hunting, uh, the hunting task forces. And they will provide that. But... They're providing that in addition to the British ones. And that's a useful thing they can do. It's, the French are really quite clever in that their admirals managed to get through enough, their chiefs and navy staff managed to get through enough, which is going to be useful, that they can support in, in a way which is going to be essential, the British. And they are very useful as a force enabler. And you have to remember that our points in the 1930s where the French are almost as close with the Royal Navy as the Commonwealth navies are. They're almost as close. They're that level of integration almost. And there's a lot of strong relationships built up in this period. So, the Fre uh, you know, it's an interesting. Also, as said by Verdun, and I was going to be getting to a point, there's another point for the French in that if you build ships around, uh, why build ships around hunting the Deutschland class specifically when there is already Renown, Repulse, and Hood in the world? And they're your allies and probably going to be involved in it. Yes, these ships are going to have an advantage to doing that. They are going to have a viability. But the fact is that they're faster than Deutschland class. Well, let's consider this. Deutschland class cruiser. Their top speed is 28 knots. Now, yeah, that's fast, but that's not earth-shattering fast, is it? That's that's fast battleship fast. That's... Interesting that they're... Um... Yeah, I, I think the, uh... the bit rate dropped down there for a bit. I'm not sure why. Sorry about that. 
but and as useful as they are the French battleships can catch them but that's not really saying they can catch those is not really putting them in the battle cruiser circumstance let's be honest if you're talking about ca being built to destroy cruisers is a function for capital ships even non -ca non battle cruiser ones There are many ways to view burn. Most of them not necessarily good. Hmm. Most of them not necessarily good. I have to say, I'm carefully watching the bitrate, because I have upgraded the bitrate to try and give you a better delivery, basically. And it crashed a couple of minutes ago, and it's now gone back up to enough. I do realize it should be ideally somewhere in the region of 4,160 kilobytes a second. But it's again, it's all being run off this poor laptop. And again, that's all. I've got three big expenses this year. I've got a tax bill. Eh, you always have those. I have going to be binding a load of copies of my PhD thesis because it can be finally be fully lodged and all those things. And um, and sort of publicized at some point. So at some point it's going to be converted into a book. And uh, I've got to get a new tower. I have got to get a new tower. So I don't, uh, the, the, I've come back from Canada. Canada was wonderful. And Canada is lovely. And I'm going to be trading off Canada for a long, long time in terms of my happy moments whenever I need to go to a happy place. But, uh, yeah. yeah the, I, I, every time I work, do this stuff work with the computer, and the reason I'm wandering about now is I'm making, making sure it's petal. Uh, I'm doing sort of conversation till making sure I, that the bit rates settle down. Um, every time I use it, I go, ooh, you poor thing, I do need to get a tower set up for you. Jerry Cron, the sound has improved quite a bit. I'm glad the sound has improved quite a bit. Nice turn. Why did the French fail to factor in that, that at best Renown or Pulse available as Hood might not be available? Actually, it's a flagship, so only available for certain parts of the year. Um, well, let's be honest, that's the Royal Navy's problem, not the French. And Hood will probably be available. One of them will. Right now, so the Atlantic is, again, it's surface radar actions, and the only circumstance that, let's be honest, fighting in the Atlantic, if you're thinking about 1920s and 30s, you're either thinking about submarines, convoy time, which is the Aviosos and the various submarines the French came up with, fine. Fighting in, you're dealing with large surface raiders, again. The British will take the lead, and the British will provide the majority of the forces for this. So the only war you, person you'd be fighting in the Atlantic would be the Germans. If you're fighting the British or the Americans in the Atlantic, you're gone if you're the French. Um, and fighting in the Far East, you've got the Allies. So the French Navy is an Allied Navy. It's a core Navy. Yes, it's got its capabilities, but it's going to be part of an Allied force. Good luck with that one, Sean. Anyway, Alice Short. Hello, and how's the cruiser today? Very French. So, here are their strategic concerns. Fascisti Italy. Yes, this is Mussolini, who served in the infantry, 
at various points. But he put on a snazzy Victorian style almost suit and garb to go to Rome to agree a treaty over Rome with the Vatican. He then puts on this snappy white costume for uh, going and meeting the black shirts at a summer camp. Why? Who would want to go to a political summer camp? The whole point of a summer camp is you go away to have fun and get some peace. If everyone's discussing politics the whole time, you are never going to have any fun, any peace, or any at all decent food. Because everyone's going to be wanting to have long conversations and speeches, which means the food is going to go cold before you're able to eat it. So why would anyone want to go to a political summer camp? Why? And his dictator snazzy uniform thingy he wears to talk in the crowds. Oh, I don't know. Let's be honest. Fascist Italy is an interesting thing for the French to deal with. They are building up a comprehensive navy, a balanced navy, barring lacking an aircraft carrier. And of course, the French do have the burn, but let's be honest, does that really count? Uh, they're building up a very balanced force, a very capable force. And of course... Mussolini likes to clothe himself with the garb of Rome, likes to talk about rebuilding the Roman Empire, which at one point included most of Gaul, which of course is France, and various other territories, so the French worry about that one, but also quite a lot of North Africa. And he talks about the sea as Mare, Mediterranean as Mare Nostrum. Okay. The French get into a nice little construction race vis-a-vis -vis destroyers and various cruisers. Uh, with the Italians, and honestly, the Italian Navy is more of a presence in their strategic thinking than anything else, because, as I've mentioned several times, the only war they're unlikely to end up to potentially fighting solo would be one versus the Italians. In other scenarios, they would be fighting with an allies. Fighting the Italians, the British might just lead them to it, but again, the British will have a if the Italians win too hard, they'll probably try and stop the war or they'll come in on the French side because they can't afford to have the French allies cut down too far just in case of what could happen in a wider European conflict and vis-a-vis -vis the international situation. It's fun times. Thank you, Bijan, for the tower fund. Thank you. Unless everyone has the same political opinion, in which case it won't be more than a five-minute discussion for the whole time anyway. Similar to not getting accosted by uh, well-meaning Mormons if you're in Salt Lake City. No, no, they, they, they trust me, no, 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 no. They will want to discuss everything, chew everything. I... Politics has its place, and it does need to be discussed, and it is something which you need to consider seriously and with full thought to come to your own uh, to come to your own opinions on it. I always support that. Summer camps, no. Anything which is verging on a holiday, I don't want to be discussing politics during. I want to have peace. Don't worry, if France fight Italy, Britain will try to nab something like Mallorca and Sardinia. Eh, probably not. <sighs> to be argued, the French. Uh, no, it's agreement. Isn't that exactly what happens? The French got cut down too much, but not by the, uh, not by outside factors. They cut themselves down too much. Don't worry, he also sent both his sons into the land-based air force to emphasize his commitment to the new tech. We will get over there. Um, he also made himself, of course, Minister of Navy. And like every other fascist dictator who comes from the infantry, he was obsessed with building big, far ships with big, far, uh, big guns. Yes, as always, you have a fascist dictator who doesn't really think about infrastructure long term or anything, even though they're talking about ruling for a thousand years. Not, uh, that's not going to happen. Um, but they are obsessed with building it big, building it fast, and building it flashy. And massive guns. And as such, the French have to constantly think about what exactly are they building next door? And 
in comment to some people's responses earlier when talking about things, uh, the Italians were just as interesting when it came to abiding by treaties as the Japanese. Concurrent, the British three-day political conference is one day politics and two days of booze, no matter what the party. Spread over the three days, yes. But that's a conference, not a summer camp. And also, to be honest, in my experience, despite uh, uh, speaking as the one who's always sober, because I don't drink at these things, that describes pretty much most British conferences for any subject, whether it's politics, uh, whatever, no matter what the topic. If it's a three-day uh, conference, one day is politics, uh, one day is discussion, and two days are parting, and your one day of discussion is basically whichever day you're not you're presenting. So, the Italians are the scary thing. Uh, JC, were well, some accounts a common thing in Britain? I think of them as an American thing. Oh, there are scouts. There are the jamborees. And there are various other forms of summer camp in the UK. But they are more of an American thing. And cadets as well, like summer camps. And summer camps for adults especially should not be revolving around politics. <sighs> Give me... Seriously... I want a writing holiday. I want a writing holiday right now. I've got so much writing to do. Uh, I don't know. Leave that to one side. Now I've thought of the idea. I'm just going. Uh... Dan Freeman, read leaders with passing infantry. Read notable that Tojo was infantry, Churchill was cavalry. I think Franco was infantry, and of course uh, Hitler was infantry. So, was World War II really infantry versus cavalry? Well, Roosevelt wasn't in the forces. It's an interesting question to get into. Butlins is, of course, the British summer camp fun place. Also, Centre Parks. Who would have won the... Let... Please don't take this the wrong way, because I don't think I've done the, mo uh, the uh, most obsessive study of it, but in my experience, Hitler basically has two costumes of studying a picture of him, two looks. Franco basically has one look. Mussolini has an entire wardrobe. So, the most sartorially obsessed fascist dictator, please stand up. Right, Japan. Well, if you're Far East, you have to talk about Japan. They are a strategic contradiction. At the same time as building a massive new monument to their democracy and state, the Diet, they ha also have, as their Secretary of Education, the statist... Um, I, uh, not even a good theorist and various other things, Lieutenant General and Baron... Sado Araki, army minister, then education minister in economy. You know, you think, in a nice way, if any of you are sitting there going, ah, my, ah, this government's picked a really bad education minister. Nope, nope, nope. There is, it takes a long, long run up to top this guy for being a bad choice for education minister. A long, long run up, and I mean a really long run up. I haven't yet seen that. Uh, I have looked at a lot of them. There are some I would say are not that great, but compared to him, they are they are they're frankly amazing. Um, Japan, of course, slowly conquering, and again, you always have to remember for France, whilst that bit over there is Burma, uh, which is British, this bit over there is French territory. And so the French bit was always closer to, in terms of large chunk of territory, closer to Japan's expansion than anywhere else. You know, we talk about the Dutch being worried because they're oil fields, etc. The, the French literally have a border with China, which the Japanese are trying to take over. The, the, the French are quite consistently far more worried than almost any other European power against, about Japanese expansion. Uh, when they're actually paying attention to it, rather than their own cabinet reshuffles. 
And then, of course, we have Shoah, the Shah Emperor, Hirohito. He, this is him when he was enthroned in 1928. Again, you have to remember, this is the, you know, the entire example after news of the Japanese state. Theoretically, all powerful. Reality, no power. Reality, no power day to day or any organization. It's a case of the whole of Japan, a Japanese system is you have this constitution, this wonderful theoretically democracy and all these things. And in reality, you set up for a backroom military dictatorship in the way that you run the constitution and states that uh, give certain powers to the, mini uh, to the militaries, to the, military, uh, to the army and navy, where they can pr de facto bring down a government by refusing to serve in it. The idea what, when they were setting it up was they would always be honourable and would always do serve out of duty and would never be so political as to use that position, uh, that power given to them in the constitution to undermine dem dem uh, democratically elected governments and of course the reality is they do because in the end at a certain level everyone's a politician this might be dirty for you all to think about but at a certain level in organizations everyone has to become a politician and everyone has to become out for the power and preservation of their organization because everyone else is we would like a world where that wasn't the case but humans inevitably will do so. There are going to be people who are more that way inclined and those are the people who then you have to become that way inclined to fend off. Because there's always going to be at least one person who is going to be a empire-building egomaniac who gets to the top of an organization. They might not even show that until they get there and then once they're in power, they suddenly go, ooh, I can add that, and I can add that, and I can do that, and I can do that. And you find yourself, you start off with the best of intentions of working with everyone, and then you end up with going, hang on, I'm losing half my department, all my budget, and I've got a, uh, all these people are going to be unemployed, and it's being run badly, and I need to start fighting back. That is the reality of it. Chris H., I still have scars from summer scout camps in the mid uh, some of scout camps in the mid '80s. Every time my friends go away to Jamboree, I worry about them. As a shot, yes. Brass bands contest drink theatres dry. Theatres dry. I mean, brass band contests, if they do not drink an entire county dry, do not consider are not do not are not really contests. Uh, there there is a movie called Brassed Off, which is well worth a watch if no one's ever watched it, and it literally has a it shows them at a brass band concert a contest and uh, you know where they're all playing and literally they are going from pub to pub to pub to pub to pub with playing in between those pubs that is what a brass band contest is like and i have been to many of those in my time they are wonderful there's brilliant music but you honestly you, the amount of let's put it way the amount of soft drinks i was consuming to keep up with them i was probably had enough sugar in my system to give an elephant diabetes by the end of it. It's just that it is that way. Come on, Ian. The Zenist Beta Never Academy was sponsored by Old Benito, and looking at the French holdings, made it made it, it, it even it made it even more interesting. Hmm. Were they? Their big bad battleships get sunk or heavily damaged by slow string of torpedoes from Matrix Lustrous and later Roma goes from boom from precision guided bomb. There's no precision guided bombs in the 1930s. They're just they're being developed and they're not really that. And those battleships are still viable. And as I discussed when the Italian military archives on the live on Toronto, they there are a lot that get sunk, but there are a lot of, they get recovered, they get rebuilt, and they're back in service. The Italian military is navy is far stronger than the French, or the probably uh, than the French in uh, World War Two, and a lot stronger than the Germans in terms of a balanced fleet. Schumacher, does Goering also count? There's a lot of questions about Goering does also count because he was also constantly playing dress up. Goering didn't actually get to be a dictator. 
he might have been Hitler's nominated heir, but he never actually got to be it, so he doesn't count. He's just another guy who likes dressing up in snazzy uniforms, and is constantly inventing new snazzy uniforms to wear. Rangash, the Italians and Japanese are amateurs in treaty games. They need to research water as armour. <laughs> Vision. The Imperial Japanese government was constitutionally designed to be run by the great men of the Meiji era. When these founding fathers died, a chaos ensued. Yep. Hello, Brian and Larson. Everyone, sounds like you achieved a fry like stage of caffeine there, good doctor. <laughs> you have no idea. I didn't sleep for a week. <laughs> <laughs> they, it, of course, because you can't get iron brew in the pub, so it's Coke. Coke, 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 Coca Cola, Pepsi, Coke, 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 Coca Cola, Pepsi, Coca Cola, Coca Cola, Coca Cola, and by the end of it, you are literally going. And it started off at nine a.m. in the morning and didn't finish till like gone twelve o'clock at night. I used to have a DVD double of Brassed Off and the Full Monty. Hmm, that sounds like a good double. <laughs> uh, yeah. Nice so, Yeah, I honestly can't take this unbalanced shot, given how easily the British disabled them at Toronto. The British disabled free at Toronto. And that's not really easy. Consider that operation. That is an absolutely amazing operation. It's not easy. Were the Italians necessarily prep for it? No, uh, not really. But there again, they have issues and they have they have debates going on. And there could have been heavier AA. There are all sorts of scenarios going on. But also, you have to remember the fact is there were a great debates about how the British pulled it off. And many people thought it was fluke, as I've been over before. The fact is, the British had the, had the fins, which are people about, but they also had the tension cable. And they had the swordfish, which was basically custom-built for dropping those torpedoes. So that changes the scenario. If, you, if other people had realised that capability was going on, then that would change things. Robson, the only competition that consume uh, competition that consumes more alcohol than Ras Bambash is the Somerset Cider one. Oh, do not get the Somerset Cider. Do not get me started on that one. Come on, it's interesting they chose the same actor to play both Patton and Mussolini films. Something to do with dressing up? I have no idea. Probably he was the only actor who could really pull off looking so stylish. I'm not sure about that. Uh, but a uh, pattern, I always think he's better playing pattern than Mussolini himself. Anyway, thanks to Millerand, de Mugur, and Lebrun, successfully they managed to turn Weimar Republic, which is probably one of the most liberal democracies ever conceived in the 1920s and 30s, into, in, in 1920s, into another armband obsessive uniform wearing mustachioed um infant a former world war one infantryman turned military mastermind and obsessive about re regaining power and former glories yeah so this is a problem if you decide you are going to keep uh, you are going to keep punishing the new regime which comes in after the old regime which is already, and you notice, is suffering from a perception that it that stabbed the soldiers in the army in the back. And you keep punishing them financially, sanctioning, invading, all sorts of things you do to coerce them. Uh, it might be good for the red meat, a good, good red meat for people at home to give you strong, you know, internal politics. But externally, it tends to turn a country which is looks like it's going fairly egalitarian and peaceful, and probably could have done if a little bit of support, um, into that. So there's a lesson for you in the future. 
Be careful how you write a peace negotiator treaty and be careful about how you enforce it and how you treat the people. Because you might just be sowing the seeds for your future war. And let's be honest, France suffered badly in World War I and they suffered even worse in World War almost worse in World War II. They didn't have the meat grinder of Verdun, but they suffered the ignominy of defeat and being pulled apart. And they didn't deserve that. They didn't deserve either of those scenarios. But honestly, in the interwar period, they didn't do anything like anything to really sucker and try and promote this and return as a point I'll always make. The fascist dictatorships come about mostly because the elites of a country are looking for something to protect them from the rise of communism. And the weaker you make the Weimar Republic look, the more you make the elites go go hunting for something like this. It's the same as happened in Italy uh, in 1922. In the case of Franco, I also consider him more a Francoist than a Nazi, or than a fascist, and he goes and he adopts fascism. He's the representative of the elite. He doesn't like the way the government's going. He's leading him, and he gets the fascist on side to get support. He adopts fascist, uh, fascist, uh, the fascist for the support, not because he is really fascist. He's more Franquist. He's more out for him. This is what happens. You, For most of the period, this is the point. For the vast majority of the period we're talking about, we are talking about the Weimar Republic. Nazi Germany doesn't come to power till, well, really, in 1933, really. Uh, it's in January 1933 that Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany. So... From 1918 to 1933, January 1933, you're dealing with the Weimar Republic. If we consider back to those presidents, that means for all of Milleran's reign, for all of de Merck's reign, and for the uh, all de Meur's reign and for the start of Lebron's reign, you are dealing with the Weimar Republic. And yes, there is the Wall Street crash in 1929. But as I mentioned in the uh, the Equitable Treaty series, if the Weimar Republic had been invited to go join the London Naval Treaty and been given the ability to construct some battleships. They'd have leaped on it, and it could well have been enough to shore up because the people have seen they're protecting Germany. They are standing up Germany. They're restoring some of the honour. But instead, by keep pushing them down, you actually perpetuate and harden the belief that they did stab the military in the back. And the idea that the military could have actually won or at least staved off the defeat of World War One, No, that's no chance. Germany was crushed. Yes, the troops didn't, sta- didn't march onto German soil, but it wouldn't. It wasn't a short time before they were going to. The BEF was going to be a British army was going to be marching on there very sh- soon uh, when war ended, and the Americans wouldn't have been far behind them. But that doesn't matter. The myth has been built, and by keep pushing Germany down, by keep using Germany as a crutch to blame all your problems on you build up to this and then you do have a threat so it's a it's an example of a self-fulfilling prophecy your fears of german militarism and let's be honest gaston dumerc takes a firm stance against germany and its resurgent nationalism he's really worried about his resurgent nationalism He's in power 1924 to 1931, June 1931 and June 1924. When he starts off, there is not a nationalist Germany going on. There is still nationalism there, but 
a little bit of support and a little bit of London Naval Treaty work and various other things could well have restored German honour and could have given them a different position, given them some strength and support. Take care, Jamie. Sandrine listens in not looking at Afghanistan over the last few decades. Vision. Mm -hmm. So do appeasement in the treaty, not when the losses are, losers are angry at the treaty 15 years later. You don't need to do appeasement in the treaty. That's not what I'm saying. You need to have, in the nicest way, you don't need to stomp over the Weimar Republic. You need to try and treat them as an equal. You need to give them some sort of support and some sort of... Uh, you, you can... Uh, but, Making remarks like you're going to squeeze the Germans to uh, the German orange till the pip squeak. That doesn't help. That might make you feel big and strong and powerful at home, but that's going to create an enemy which you do not want to have. Hi, Stafford. Hope your mum's car's okay. Jonathan, I often wonder what would have happened if in the 1920s Germany, France, and Belgium formed a free trade zone like in the 1950s. It could have been interesting, but you have to remember also that Germany and France were their largest trading part, each other's largest trading partners, right up until 1939. And that's nice. France wants Germany to be weak, so Germany invading can never happen, which is why, again, you put them into the treaty system. Uh, as I seem to remember putting in the Equitable Treaty, if you make Germany have to be half the strength of France, well, they're never going to be able to invade Ger uh, take on France in the naval war. And it's a naval treaty. You say, look, we're leaving the land war treaties as we were, but we're going to give you naval power. So you can now spend your money building up your navy. And the industrial might building up your navy. And yes, I do realise France wanted Germany demilitarised after World War II and the Soviet Union wrecked those plans. I, I do know that 961, but again, I would argue that the French do not learn from history. So the French Ruhr impact invasion did have an impact on the rise of... It makes the Weimar Republic look weak and unable to defend their own home. PCH. By the way, Doctor, I did find out how donkey pumps were used in the bar in the late 19th century. The answer's on my Vauxhall episode. I will enjoy and look forward to it. Uh, UN, Marshall Plan, EU, and NATO are all answers to the failures of 1918-1939. Yes. Right. So the trouble is, that is not the only area you have sowing of issues. You also have the legacy of the Yun Ajun Ecole. The Yun Ecole. Louis Emile Bertin. That's the light cruiser name for him, the Emile Bertin. Here is the ultimate problem. For the Junicole, that basically boils down to using the lightest possible force to take out the biggest possible enemy, right? Your theoretically is you want to use light, disposable, easily replaced forces, and cheap forces, to take out your enemy's major capability. In the 1920s and 30s, especially in the 1930s, this screams to me in naval terms, aircraft carrier. The French could have built an aircraft carrier at any time. They only have one. They have the tonnage. They don't. The Juno Coal is very slow to coming after. Uh, coming. Afterwards. And yes, this is a later photo of her. I think she. you are right in that she is 
missing uh, her second uh, a gun in the second turret. So she's technically at this point an eight gun ship rather than a nine gun ship. So, the Juno Coal is critical for the French. They are obsessed with it. Their navy still living it. You have to remember, you're dealing with generations officers who were trained by generations officers who lived up with the Juno Coal as basically being Bible dogmatic, uh, the most, the Bible of the French navy. They and a dogmatic version of the Bible at that, and dogmatic interpretation. If you were looking for a similar, I'm not sure which force you could go to, in terms of their obsession, there's just so much, so much they're obsessed with it. And yet, The French are trying to still build it. So what are they building it for? The French are building the Juno Coal in many ways are an issue. They're almost adopting a fisherized approach to it, but the, the trouble is they're adopting a fisherized approach through fighting over it. Massive fighting. Because there's a real realization that the Atlantic and Japan policies turning up with light cruisers for surface raiding and flotillas of destroyers and small ships, whilst lovely, are not going to get them any attention. Then, in the nicest way, there is no way they're going to be able to provide enough small ships that they're going to even register compared to the amounts in a Pacific War that the British and American would, Americans would turn up with. They just won't. They won't even, they won't even tick the meter. At no point, they, 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 they would just be a case of, oh, you've, you've arrived. Oh, that's cute. But... They don't also... They also don't fully commit to it because of the fighting. But the fact is, the Junicol faction is powerful enough they get this ship. This ship which becomes the basis of all subsequent French cruiser production named for Louis Emil Bertin. Now, Okay, you can say they have a problem with naming their cruisers. Maybe, maybe they're really short of names for cruisers. But let's, you know, French cruiser names. There are plenty of good options. There are plenty of lovely options. If we consider, we can go down the list. There's Arafuse, there's Dubonin, there's Milan, there are the Dubonin class, the Condor class. There are all sorts of names of cruisers that they have used before, which they could be going for again. Uh, there's Devu, Socha, Forben, Sokov, Trond, Cosmo, Land, Jambat, Descartes, and Yes, in the nicest way, I do find it slightly worrying that they named a cruiser for Descartes, which is named for an actual philosopher. I just, yeah, we, 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 we'll, get, we'll get over that, okay, being named for Descartes. But there are lots and lots of names they could go for before they go for, they pick this guy. And honestly, they're picking this name is, in many ways, a desire to, how do I put this politely? A desire to push forward with 
the Je ne Quoi. They also, by the way, and here are some of the things I find interesting, they also managed to name one of their cruisers for the Georges Lyons uh, for one of the Mer Minister of Marines. Uh, he was one of the ones who worked with Henry Salon, and he was one of the ones who tried to attempt to gain a naval rearmament priority over the Maginot Line. He also served as Prime Minister of France at one point, uh, between September 1920 and January 1921. Hmm. The fact is, there is a ship currently in service which is named for him as well. He was Minister of Marine 1917 to 1920, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, 20 to 21, at the same time as being Minister of France. Minister of Marine, 1925 to 26, 26 to 30, uh, 30 to 31, and 32 to 33. Many, many times does he serve as Minister of Marine. Many times does he try and fight for him, and many times he gets beaten. Just not successful. The Juna Cole is a strategic part of the French forces, but also there is another reason it doesn't die, because it serves another faction very well. And this is the faction which is focusing on the land power, which is a very big thing for the French. But let's be honest, there are some strategic problems here. A, you can tell on the Italian border exactly where the uh, mountains get really big, because that's where they don't have the... Border, the um, actual construction of the fort. But yeah, the forts are down there to face off against the Italians as well. And then if we look up north, uh, they of course ignore the Swiss border. Mainly because the Swiss are stubborn enough that no one's going to go through them. But you have a great big strategic issue. Yeah, You're spending a lot of money on these events. Look at how complicated they are. They're going to be the focus of it. In which case, for the French Navy, they're basically building cruisers as that cruiser warfare, la guerre de course, you know, the economic warfare of cruisers, the secondary offensive asset and the asset they can provide to the Allies in a war in, Europe, in the Far East or in the Atlantic. All these things are great things they can do. And makes sense. But there's a, a small strategic problem for France. And it's it's an issue which gets multiplied and is one of the reasons why they are quite so essentially dependent upon British support and tied to the British. It's that border with Belgium. Because strategically they decide building a fortification along the whole their border to the sea would look bad. It would look like they didn't like Belgium. And it would look like they were sacrificing Belgium to the Germans. But also, as it was, they built in such a way they're reliant on Belgium building their own equivalent, and Luxembourg building their own equivalent, even though they have far smaller budgets, far smaller countries, and can't afford to. Oh. So you see, your balance fleet approach in many ways, is competing for budget not with the Je ne Col. No, it's competing for budget with the Maginot Line. And the Je ne Col is considered a nice way of saying the Navy has a budget and has a reason for it, but there's also, it doesn't need to be massive because it's the Je ne Col idea, it's the new school, it's the French school. And so we can spend most of the money on the Maginot Line. And the Maginot Line has three great advantages for politicians who do not want to focus on military affairs, do not want to think too much about the military, and want to try and save money on it, and not spend money on it, and who are worried the military might oppose them. The soldiers are all stuck on the borders. They're stuck in positions where they cannot really move around that easily. And... Mm, they don't need to have an investment in a lot of movement and communications gear. Now, again, I mentioned some names earlier, Ben Wallace and Penny Mordant, and one of the reasons why I like 
mentioned Ben Wallace is because, very interestingly, as a Minister of Defence, uh, Secretary of Defence, he's done something recently, which also Penny Morton had has done previously, um, is actually give a talk in front of committee and honestly admit that you have that defence has been hollowed out for many many years. That investments in communications gear, uh, stockpiles of weapons, infrastructure, the non-sexy stuff which the press don't want to take pictures of and post and all these things has been hollowed out at the expense of other programs in order to say we are still providing defense and we're still providing all these sexy stuff which you're going to take photo of. But uh, in return, you don't see that really we're spending the money on other things and we don't want to spend the money on defense because we think the other things matter more. Because wars are going to be wars of choice. This scenario is if Weimar Germany is weak and you're keeping Weimar Germany weak, um, then you don't need to worry about Belgium. So you are entirely building this and the, the idea of an invasion through Belgium because the Weimar Germany will never manage to invade through Belgium. So therefore, you don't need to worry about filling it off uh, and filling up that line. And then you can use that as an excuse not to spend on it. So you've built enough that you can say, we've defended France. Look how strong the Maginot line is. Look how powerful it is. Look at how much defense. Why do you think that would fail? But reality, you have managed to scrimp money and you have scrimped money based on the idea that Germany will not attack through Belgium again because Belgium's not going to build that because you've managed to piss off the Belgians. It's always fun. Colonel Crash, I always thought the French interwar cruiser and cattle ship builds almost seem to almost always be reactionary rather than overall strategy. They're always portrayed as being reactionary rather than having a strategy. They do have they are instead what they have is a constantly changing strategy and a constantly changing debate and discussion. And sorry for anyone if I do keep burping, it's basically I'm surviving today on Iron Brew. I do apologize. I should realize I did it again. Um uh, as at the beginning, I've missed I, three times. I've tried to get myself food, and I've basically adulted instead. And uh, yeah, Vision, imagine Fortress of Doom Singapore in 1941 uh, with Maginot level of defense plus airfields with planes. Um, yeah. So, basically, France's strategic gambles in the 1920s and 30s are um, relying on Belgium building the same level of fortifications as France does without paying for them. Rely, i.e. they rely on a smaller power to fight their battles for them. And other people go, well, you know, they, they were designing it so they would force the Germans to come through Belgium. No one designs your forces to fight so they come through Belgium and find an easy access point. It's There is no idea sitting, sitting there and going, you know what, Belgium is a great place to have a battle. Let's. It's not good logical sense. If you were actually thinking of it in a logical military strategic mind, you would actually complete the fortifications all the way to the coast yourself, then return around to go to Belgium and go, if you want to, be, we'll help you, because look at all the supplies we're ordering to build it to ourselves, to defend us. We'll also build, uh, help you buy the supplies to build your own border, your own defences along your own border. So that, you know, for any attack into the area of Belgium, which is easier to get through and manoeuvre vehicles, you'd have to get through the Belgian defences and the French defences to get to France. <sighs> it's fun. It really is. So this is the problem for the French. They do have a strategy going on, but the strategy is most often a political and economic debate between the people who don't want to spend money and use the Maginot line as the cover for not spending money, and the people who are not sure what to spend money on and constantly changing their minds over what, what and how they're going to spend it and what they're going to talk about. Which is what makes the fact that you get the sensible policies you do come about even more strange and even more interesting. Excuse me, back in a second. What are you up to? What are you up to?
In, in, come on, in, come, 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 follow me, in, come, come in and behave, yes, come in and behave you, you don't do that, do you, and we'll hope your mummy doesn't notice what you did, I'd like to apologise now. I honestly wasn't moving pots for mummies. Hello. Right. Oh. Oh. You stay up here for a second. Yes, we'll keep an eye on you. No. So. Ah. Uh, no one does ever expect them to go to Belgium, through Belgium, until they go through Belgium. Ships overall. These are three good books. Uh, two are by John Jordan and uh, Robert Dumas. Both worth reading and both excellent. Um, and Stephen Roberts' book, Up Top, which of course is behind me there. Ste uh, French steamships in the uh, it's a French warships in the age of steam, 1959 to 1940, 1914. All excellent and worth reading. There is a bit of a gap between 1914 and 1922, but you managed to get around it. Oh, I'll get some food after this is finished. This won't be a, a, a nice way. This has got about four more slides to go and some questions, so it should be fine. Hello. Now, and overall, the French are building some very interesting ships. They are attempting to build, well, they oscillate between attempting to build a Juna Coal fleet and a balanced fleet. Which is why you see sort of the extreme shifts in construction emphasis, and one of the reasons why the yards are keep being mucked round. The fluffy research assistant is fine. He's fed. He's just moving pots. I don't know. The French are constantly developing their forces. They're constantly trying to improve their forces. And one of the interesting things what working through was the foundries in terms of producing guns. Two or three millimeter gun, the eight inch gun is a classic example. The French build what is considered by the states of the time a simplistic design. But it's a very capable and effective design. And it makes the most of their infrastructure and industrial base to produce it. Uh, John Sachs, I was wondering how if drinking a two liberal iron brew you would get through three hours of live stream. I do. Besides, that's roughly a thousand calories. It's not a thousand good calories, but it's a thousand calories. It's a lot of caffeine and sugar. Right. Good luck, William Cox, with the, um, your mental garden. From this period onwards, the French are constantly wrestling with infrastructure needs, with how they build things and how they build and where they build them. The design factors and what they produce are some of the most interesting structures. One of the interesting things with the French is that at no point they produce overly armed ships in the interwar period, in 1920s and 30s. At no point do you turn around and go, well, they've crammed every single gun they could into that hull. At no point. And honestly, that's a... How do I put this politely? They... <laughs> oh... They're trying their best to build very balanced ships on a shoestring budget. Uh, when you start looking at the cruisers, 
and especially when you start to look at the Ooh. I would go well the Legacionaire class are the classic example but um, mostly the Sufren class you know the Sufren class they are these Cruiser de Premier class and they are based on Ducassines, but they have a higher standard displacement. They have 10,000 long tons, and they are designed in many ways to around the Rato Bretang steam turbines with six Goyo de Temple Sumotri boilers. They're designed to be very efficient and very well built. They don't always work out that way. Four twin turrets, they sort of mirror the county class. But then you have the Due Trugans, which have eight hundred fifty five millimeter guns in in four twin turrets. And then of course La Gassonier class, which are nine hundred fifty two millimeter guns. In free triple turrets. These ships, at no point did the French go around and go, you know what, we're going to try and put 12 8 inch guns, or we're going to try and overpower our Italian counterparts with firepower and speed as cruisers. No, they're building balanced cruisers. Which to me shows that the chiefs of naval staff managed to keep mostly. The various factions in balance when constructing their ships. And they kept them in balance by giving each or putting enough in each ship that would make them happy. It doesn't always necessarily make them enough ha happy enough, but it makes them happy for the well, let's be honest. For the Junacol, the Due Turin, Turin class, have a range of 7,000 nautical miles at 12 knots. Good for surface rating, which is part of that. And, well, I don't know. That's the Lagosinia class, have a range of 7,000 nautical miles at 12 knots. Sorry. Due Turins have a range of 3,000 nautical miles at 15 knots. And the Sufren class, well, theirs is mm, 4,600 nautical miles at 15 knots. Or 3,700 nautical miles at 20 knots. It's interesting to look through the ships and go, where, where are you built for the Mediterranean? Are you built for the Atlantic? Are you built for the, uh, you know, what sort of operation are you building? You're fighting the Mediterranean or fighting outside the Mediterranean? They also have the difference in the roles they're going to take on. The French ships, you can honestly say, switch around. In a Mediterranean strategy campaign, the capital ships and the heavy cruisers are probably the fleet in being force which are back up for the light crews and destroyers which will be going out doing the anti-commerce ops and the various ops around that for any operations outside of the mediterranean the capital ships the heavy cruisers are going to take the lead they're going to be the cause of any Surface hunting groups, surface raid hunting groups, they're going to be the cause of any force deployed to the Far East, etc. Because, again, far ships like that are going to be useful. If they can get out to uh, get out to the Far East quickly, they can reinforce the British initial elements out there. They can give the British support, which can be used for a, seat, a bigger seat at the table, more influence. Um, I can. I will get real food. Do not worry. There will be real food. I'm on schedule to finish this at half nine, roughly, depending on questions. It's all fine.
and I know exactly who the food will come from at half nine. So, let's consider the Croze de Premier Class. This is four of the seven heavy cruisers built. Notice something? They have a bit of a consistency going on. This is one of the first things I look for when I'm trying to discern whether a nation has a strategy or not. I don't start off with the papers. I don't start off with the discussions. I go and look at the construction. And I go and look at the ships. And I try and discern patterns. And for all these ships, going through them, the hulls, the raking of the bows, the shaping of the hull, the form, they have a very similar outline. Yes, Aldri is different. But for the others, there is a consistency there. There is a consistency in funnel arrangement. Aldri is different because these are all light cruisers. This is the first attempt at a heavy cruiser. These are all light cruisers, cru premier cru cruisers of the premier class. They are built with the idea that 8-inch guns does not make a ship a heavy cruiser. They are built with the idea that sort of armor is still going to be is going to be there, but these ships are built for speed, firepower, they are built to be fast. They are light cruisers with 8-inch guns. This is the, the French trying to go, well, we're, we're sort of trying to build something almost in the heavy cruiser mold, but not quite. It still is, to an extent, a armored light cruiser, I would call it. It's a you know, town class equivalent in its armoring. And yes, it's got eight inch guns. It's got nine of them. Very efficient, thank you very much. But it's not exactly that heavy. Or that, or rather, when I say heavy. It's not a heavy cruiser designed to fight other heavy cruisers. And you sort of go, well, hang on, why are they not? Well, the French, A, think their force is going to be hunting in a pack. They're not designing for one-on-one -on -one conflict or one-on-one -on -one fight. They are, hammer banks, they are um, designing it for fighting in a pack. Now, I would also add that with French cruisers, and I have mentioned this occasionally, even ships which belong to the same classes, and whilst externally looking very similar, internally might be more cousins than sisters, if we're going to describe them in familial terms, there are differentials. But these ships, lovely as they are, are very capable at what they are. And again, I almost wish the, I especially wish the, the, um, I, I, I know why Wikipedia is organized and various other books are, or various books are organized in the way they're organized. But the fact is, again, the French weren't thinking in terms of producing a heavy cruiser. They weren't thinking that way. Why? Because it doesn't fit with them. They have capital ships for fighting capital ships. They have these 8-inch cruisers for forming packs to back up the British, but also forming packs with capital ships to add their fire and speed to any battle line. But not in terms of fighting as, a fighting as part of the battle line, as in forming a battle line battle. But in terms of forming a flying wing, as uh, Nice Everyone point, uh, points out, uh, like the Grass Bay face the River Plate, pretty much that's what the French are thinking in terms of dealing with surface raiders. It will be dealing with a pack of cruisers. They don't want to be fighting fair. The French aren't, and which is completely correct. No one wants to be fighting a battle fair. So, after this, you then have the light cruisers, or the really light cruisers. And that's something, when you think of it, if you presume the cruiser, the premier class, are li basically light cruisers, 
then the Kreuzer, the secondary class, Dimir um, class, they are really light ships. And then they start to make sense. They really do start to make sense. And there is Jeanne d'Arc up there, the training cruiser. But she's still expected to be a viable six-inch gun cruiser. Um, Shumak, was there any significant push for them to put on more belt armor? Because I still think there is that one or two inches of belt armor is totally inadequate for a cruiser from 1920s, 30s. You are both right and no. There wasn't. Mainly because the French were not really as obsessed with speed as some other nations were. They really weren't. Um, that's one of those first debates I get into. People go, ah, oh, well, the French were obsessed with speed. Well, no, not for their cruisers. Uh, if we're going to sort of go, again, the Suffering class, capable of 32 knots, that's roughly same there as the counties. The Dugeturin class, 30 knots. La Gassonier, 31 knots, really design speed. Theoretically, they got the 35 knots in trials, but you were, all of us realize the reality of trials is that that's not real life conditions. Because the ship is empty, the ship is moving, as uh, it's just concentrating everything on speed, and it might get up to 35 knots, but the reality is it won't. But La Gassonier class, they're not that bad. They have similar armor as a town class hmm. how would their ribs stack up against hiders mm, probably about the same actually what was the best protected French of the cruise of the 1930s oh well that's easy Algeri. That's the best protected cruiser. Um, and that can do... It displaces 10,000 long tons. It has Rato Bretang single reduction geared steam turbines. Uh, it has Gear de Temple boilers. And its armour is 4.3 inches thick in the belt. Uh, has a deck between 1.2 inches and 3.1 inches. That's 110 millimeters, 30 millimeters, and 80 millimeters. Turrets 100 millimeters on the face, 70 millimeters on the sides and roof, 50 millimeters on the rear. Conning tower 100 millimeters thick sides and 70 millimeter thick roof. Steering gear had 26 millimeters around its side, 80 millimeters on its roof. Yeah, the Algerie is the best and most heavily armoured cruiser the French have in the 1930s. And she was able to do 8,000 nautical miles at 15 knots, or 4,000 nautical miles at a sort of super cruise of 27 knots. So yeah, the, the French engines and the French gear were, uh, gearboxes were improving, and their turbines were improving. Hmm. Uh, that's a pleasure, that's what happened. Uh, calm guns, but funny thing, the French who invented the metric system used uh, 152mm guns, but the Germany, their old rival, used exactly 150mm guns, while much in the engineering still uses uh, Zoll's 25.4 in, in millimeter inches. Well, the interesting thing, of course, is the French 8-inch guns are technically 203mm guns, which means they're actually technically 7.99 something inches. So they're not actually technically 8-inch guns. Uh, Stuff Thompson, so the uh, 10, k so 10,000 ton cruisers were similar rivers as the tribal. So the tribals are overbuilt or underbuilt? Uh, well, the tribal have a lot less ribs because they're shorter, but they're they're sort of overbuilt to an extent. Their strength, uh, they're, they're built to be slight. You have to remember the tribals are 
again, are built for certain operations. And they have to be built up that level because of the way they're mounting guns and how the gun mounting guns has an impact. After all, in superstructure, it looks like they left it unfinished to save mass. Not quite. Uh, it's, the, it's the superstructure of the style, of the time. And for the French, it's quite a consistent one. What it gets really quite interesting is when various governments come to the idea of we'll just scale up one of our cruiser designs to create a capital ship. Nice. Could she stand up against contemporary 8 inch gun armed cruisers? Kind of arts. Um, I would go Algerie could stand up. I wouldn't want to engage in close combat with an 8 inch cruiser, but there again, she's got similar armor to a, t a county class. She's got similar armor to a lot of. Uh, uh, you know, even some of the American interwar cruisers, uh, she probably doesn't stack up against really some of the Italian and French ones, uh, Italian and Japanese ones, sorry, but that's because they cheat tremendously. What's your favorite area of French naval history? Oh, I tend to be quite enjoy the French Navy of the Age of Sail because they do some pretty amazing things. So, Summary. And um, he says this as summary because it's to include time for questions, etc. In the end, it's about mm, 14 minutes before I'm going to go bye bye, I want some food. <sighs> so, thanks. On equal terms, should have said. Uh, on equal terms, against, um, yeah, they could stand, the French cruisers, uh, Algerie could stand up against the county class. I would probably put the more money on the county class, but that's because the county class gets more money for training than the French ones. <laughs> hey. <laughs> no need to tell those people off. Come on. And they're good ships, though. What I've tried to hold the point the way through is say that the French do have a strategy. It's divided in two. They have two competing strategies, and they have two competing doctrines for how they're going to use their ships, and this affects their designs the whole way through. But the other point I've tried to make is they've got all this going on in a period where they've also got a nation which is divided between those who absolutely never want war to happen again and therefore think they shouldn't prepare for it, and those who don't know how to or don't know what to do to prepare for it, and are politicians who don't want to spend money, do want to spend money, don't want to spend, if they want to spend money, don't want to spend money on a navy, do want to spend, uh, don't want to spend money on defense, do want to spend, uh, want to hide it by spending money on the Maginot line, don't actually fulfill the Maginot line. There are so many issues created by the various changes in leadership and government that it's amazing the French Navy turns out as coherent as it does. As coherent as it does. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm again still baffled by the belt armor. I understand why, that they aren't meant to be heavy cruisers, but I think it's desirable to not have a floating bomb. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, some of the earlier ones. Um, as we mentioned before, the Sovereign class, well, their armor belt is is 50 millimeters, 2 inches, and they are an 8-inch eight, eight light cruiser, as basically as the French are building them. But that is a very interesting amount of armor to have. Deck, 25 millimeters. So, you know, it's an interesting ratio of deck armor to belt armor. Deck, your deck armor is half your belt armor. But also, think about what you're building these ships for. If you're building a ship that lightly armored, is it supposed to be engaging in close combat? No. You're building a ship, and again, I will talk about this when I talk about Northampton class and them being scout cruisers. They're not built to engage in close quarter combat and close quarter heavy cruiser fights. And cruiser fights. They are supposed to be long range scouting kind of ships. And the French ships are built to be fast raiders. If we go back to the Western Mediterranean, uh, to the Mediterranean look. 
if you're fighting in a Mediterranean for the French, you're fighting either in air-dominated space where you're going to be wanting to move fast to get your ships through, uh, get everything through, or you're going to be doing, what, raids? Rapid battle, attacks on Italian convoys, and a, a pullback. So your basic idea is to turn up fast, blast away as quickly as possible at long range, hit as many targets as possible from that range, and then get out of there. And that's what you're armoured for. You're not supposed to be engaging in a cruiser on cruiser duel. And it's the same. It, the, the thing is, the Italians go with a similar idea of speed, but they cheat so they can have the armor as well. Because the Italians have a similar mode of operandi in terms of diving into French areas, attacking, and then get it withdrawing with the hopes of drawing the French fleet after them. Um, it's an idea. I'm not sure. I don't know if it would work. But the French, uh, but the thing is, the Italians cheat so they can have armor as well. The French don't cheat, and that's the trouble again with the ten. It's a, it's a problem with the treaty limitations you're dealing with in terms of the ship design rather than anything else. Uh, the Truins, Duque Truins, they're only seven thousand three hundred sixty-five tons in standard. So honestly, they are, I suppose, comparable to Leander class. Uh, La Gassonia, 7,600 tons standard. Again, so comparison to Leander class. Suffren class are 10,000 tons standard, and they are still built as that. But as said, 32 knots. They've got three shafts. They have a... They also... It, it, again, they have a magazine which has 50 mil armor on its sides and 20 mil on its crowns. So they have the same level of thickness of armor around their magazines as they do around their belt. Nice it runs into a Congo, it's dead. But it's not supposed to run into a Congo. If it runs into a Congo, it's supposed to be running in a pack and that pack is supposed to include something else. In the nicest way, if it runs into a Congo, and there is one of the fast battleships with them, or there is a British battle cruiser with them. The Congo is probably dead because it's dealing with a significant amount of eight-inch, eight inch, fast-moving eight-inch gun ships, and a battle and an equivalent firepower. So it better be a pack of Congos running into them. In which case, you're dealing with packs on packs and all the mentality that goes in the mentality and tactics which goes with that. Yeah, it's it's. What do you want to do with these ships? What are they for? There is no point. You cannot design a ship in isolation and go. It's got to be supreme in all circumstances. You will end up building a battleship, because that's the only one which has a chance of being supreme in all circumstances. And you're not trying to do that. You're trying to build a cruiser to do your roles for a cruiser under the treaty limitations. Sure, the French are one of the nations that are really pushing destroyer armament. Was nobody worried that their uh, their cruisers could be outmatched by a pack of destroyers? Probably, but also to an extent they're pushing the destroyers because of the Juna Col. So it goes hand in hand with everything else they do. Did we talk about the French Siamese War during World War Two? No. Because this is about the interwar period. Thanks. How would the Algeri versus Magami fight unfold? Hmm. Hmm. Let's see. Well, the Magami class have initially. Uh, nine six-inch guns, and, uh, hang on, no, 15 six-inch guns, sorry, yeah, 15, six, uh, 15 six-inch guns, and then they have 10 eight-inch guns. Uh, they have 100 millimeters of armor, so roughly the same belt. Belt over magazines, 140 mil thick, uh, deck 1.4. Hmm. 
deck slightly thicker, uh, thicker, magazines thicker. Um, I'd say if it was a fight, well, they're also capable of doing 37 knots. Uh, I would probably give it to a Magami. Uh, Magami. Uh, uh, probably the Magami would win. Uh, uh, in the 6 inch configuration, Magami would probably still win. Because the likely engagement range would be such that the 15, 16, uh, 6 inch guns would tell. But mm, they're not exactly the best 6 inch guns. So they might. It might it's going to depend on who lands the better first shot. Because let's be honest, you haven't got much armor to defend against much of anything. So the eight inch, if the if the French Aldery managed to land the first hits of the eight inch shells, and they're remotely lucky in terms of their hitting, then you could well see the Megami be out of the battle. But you know you've got two glass jaws fighting each other. Whoever gets the first big blow is probably going to win. If it's an eight inch Megami versus a six inch Megami, then the Mag the Aldery uh, eight inch Megami versus an 8-inch uh, versus the Algeri, then it's probably the Megami. Hmm. Right, that makes sense to extent, but they are they aren't faster than any other cruisers, so they can't disengage as they get caught. No, but you know, there's a limitation to what engines you're building, and remember they are built. They are very keen on having French, just as the Japanese are keen on having Japanese, and the Italians are keen on having Italian, and the British are keen on having British. And I've talked about the issues with them, with all of them in terms of their production. Uh, sorry, sorry. I meant the question more generally, but I'm assuming that was a no. Yeah. Basically, it's a case of there is only so much I can discuss in three hours. <laughs> I have to draw the line somewhere or I would be here for six hours and I wouldn't get any food tonight. <laughs> hmm. Take care, John Newman. Uh, in the Royal Navy taken up from trade trolls, what was the job of a, what, a mobile wiping unit? Uh, the mobile wiping unit were the ones probably doing the... Uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, the gaussing. So they were the gaussing of ships. And looking for... Probably looking for, uh, uh, for magnetic mines. Uh, did you run into the training cruiser of Feinville? Yes, I ran into all the German ships. I I know I haven't mentioned them much, but that's because the German ships are a product of German ideas, and yes, the French use them, but mainly they're using them so that they don't have to admit that they uh, don't have to actually build anything. Feinville is an interesting ship. What is a flare drifter? It's a vessel which is launching flares, usually for air defense, uh, but also uh, to, uh, to illuminate targets up above, but also to provide illumination for shore batteries of sea targets. And the hospital drifter trawler is a vessel which is supporting hospital vessels, and in the nicest way, it's probably moving around patients. It's basically a sea ambulance. Take care, Sage. Thank you, John Sykes. Fine, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for watching. It is now almost half past nine, and I am, as mentioned, hungry. So I'm going to say thank you to everyone. I'm going to say... What have we got coming up? Uh, I didn't underline this. Well, we've done the Fulfram class and the Londe class, so they should be underlined, and Northampton class. So it's the uh, Luigi Cadona class next week for the Rage of Marina. And next week, it's Italian naval do uh, do cruiser design doctrine. Have the French ever designed to build a, a pure, pure battle cruiser? They have considered it, but they haven't actually ordered it. 
Last one. If the requisite troll is given the role of exam, does that mean it's training for that? No. Have a good look up on. You might be interested in what exam stands for. Uh, take care, everyone. Um, hope you enjoyed this. The long patrol is going to come up on Saturday. That has got links to various things, but also, hello, Martini Henry. Thank you, and Vedan and DG40. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, what was I going to say? Yes. The questions of naval history post, the, the link is, should be, he says. No, I, I, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do an advert. I want to check the edit. Yes. There is a link down below to the quick questions of naval history. Uh, they are supposed to be six suggestions for 60 second questions that I can answer in 60 seconds while I'm doing a walk on a Sunday morning. Uh, that's what I'm going to do them as a sort of new thing and just going to see if you enjoy them all. And they're going to be my shorts. As in the ones which you record to the phone and you put up on the 60 second shorts on, on YouTube. Because I just thought it'd be interesting to do. And because I noticed no one's doing much naval history on the shorts and I thought I'd give it a go. But I'm not sure. I'm going to be looking through. And what I'll do is you will know which ones I'm going to do because I will like them. If I like them, I've recorded them. So please just keep adding questions. There are some very good ones there. There are some other ones which I do not know how fast you all think I talk. Because there is no way I can answer those questions in 60 seconds. But they are some quite good ideas. Anyway, uh, link is down below. Uh, link is down below to the Long Patrol, but that won't be live till Saturday. <laughs> and I hope you all enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank you, George Newman. Thank you, Dan Freeman. Thank you, Deglan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Night 6 one Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, John Sykes. Thank you, everyone, for the super chats. They really do keep me going. And as said, they are now going towards tax bill, research bill, uh, tower bill, and all the other things which are coming up. Because, well, if you have, probably haven't, don't need, I'm not going to go into details, but yes, universities are being their usual fun payers. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Pavatsi. Haven't seen you in ages. Hope you well. Thank you very much, and take care. If you are the one who had the same name as the last time. Anyway, take care. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Bye. Oh. And while I remember, the... is still live on Patreon. Pa uh, suggestions for Patreon's choice. I will be putting up the vote on Monday, so you've got till uh, you've got basically till Sunday, till basically the end of the live on Sunday to have put in forward suggestions for patrons' choice. Thank you very much, Aaron. Take care, and uh, yeah, it's now getting a bit dark in here, so enjoy. I'm off to get some food. Bye.